The reason we've challenged uh, Leighton Flowers to exegete John chapter 6, because we don't believe he can do it. He couldn't do Romans 9. He can't do John 6. He can't do Ephesians 1. Because these texts don't say what he says they say. And he has to bring in all sorts of external concepts. He can't simply walk through the text and have it say what he says it says. That's, that's why. Hello and welcome to Sociology 101 Live. We are going to be going through John chapter 6, beginning in verse around verse 25. And I thought to start us off as people kind of uh, log in and slowly kind of come on, we have noticed that the those watching the video grow over the first five minutes or so. And so um, in order for us to go through this text, I thought we would just have a reading of the text uh, here live for us. And so let's just dive in and listen to that. And uh, let me know on the side chat if volume sounds all right and everything's okay. Uh, Brian Wagner's already on with us, and we'll have others possibly join in with us uh, in the uh, the Geek Theology Geek Roundtable here. But here we go, listening from John chapter 6, beginning in around verse 25 here. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi! When did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. At this the Jews began to grumble about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from Him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only He has seen the Father. I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. 
Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. All right. Well, that is kind of the, something I wanted you to see there for the uh, before we begin the broadcast, because as we walk through the text line by line, I think it's important for you just to hear it in its reading. In fact, I listened to the entire uh, chapter, which, of course, you have the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, you have Jesus walking on water story, all contained in that one chapter. And then it's really interesting going on not only from chapter 5, but into chapter 7 as well. Uh, because chapter seven really speaks about some issues that I think pertain to um, how we interpret and how we understand uh, chapter six. So if you haven't done that recently, I would encourage you uh, on the in the U version app, you can play the, the audio version of any uh, and just listen as you walk or listen as you're, you're driving and listen to all of chapter five, six and seven in one sitting. And it really brings everything into context. At least it did for me as I was listening to it even again this afternoon. Um, and so without any further ado, I want to bring in uh, several others from the, the stream there. Uh, Brian and David are both with us. Welcome, guys. Uh, appreciate you guys being here. Uh, their mics are muted in now, but uh, feel free to unmute your mic and jump in as you will. Um, and we will be um, looking at several different things here. I'm gonna, you, You'll see me looking off the side here, and that's because I've got two screens next to me. And uh, this is where I have all of the, the sharing of the screens uh, beside us here. Um, and so what you'll see me do here is just add the text up here to the side of us. Um, and David and Brian and, and Matt may be uh, joining us later. Uh, feel free just to unmute your mic and comment as you will. Also, um, David, Brian, if you see uh, comments on the side chat or questions that are related to what we're talking about that you want to help interject or maybe voice the questions for them, I would appreciate that. I will do the same as I, as I see questions. I will pull them up on the screen. Uh, for example, um, before we got started here, Avery, uh, Chris Avery, which this is a big question, so it takes up most of the screen there, but he he asked this question or makes this comment. He says, Dr. Flowers, much of what I see in the exchange with the Jewish crowd in John chapter five seems to parallel what is said in John six, but I've never, but I never hear this used to support the traditionalist reading of John six. Uh, now, all I can say to that, Chris, is that maybe you haven't <laughs> listened uh, a lot to some of what I've, I've talked about, because I refer to John 5 quite regularly and the concept and the idea that those who listen and learn from the Father will listen and learn from the Son, because they're the same voice. 
And so if you're used to hearing from the father, then guess what you're going to do? You're going to hear from the son. That is something we talk about quite regularly. I may not um, uh, emphasize John chapter five in specific as much as I emphasize John in general, because all through the book of John, you hear this parallel of the father and I are one. Jesus and the father are one. If you listen and learn from, from Abraham, you heard about me. If you've read the text of old, you know about me. You've, you've listened to the, the scriptures of old. They're testifying to me. Um, so our understanding of John 6 is very much tied into the, the unity of the father and the son. And the fact that if you've heard from the father, you will listen to the son. If like Cornelius is the example that I've often referenced to, he listened and learned from the father. He feared the father. Therefore, the father gave him uh, to the son. Uh, he sent Peter to hear the, the gospel so that, that Cornelius could hear the gospel. God is faithful to give to the son those who have feared him, those who have genuinely believed in him. Uh, and he goes on, Chris, to, to write, particularly those who know the father will be drawn to the son. And that's exactly what we're just saying. Yes, absolutely. Those who know the father, fear the father, they're going to be given to the son and drawn to the son. So in John 5, 23 through 24, and in 35 through 47, we have the witness of the father, the son, John and the scriptures all being presented as being rejected by the Jews and being the reason, at least in part, that they are rejecting the son. And uh, he goes on to say, am I reading that correctly? Yes, that's exactly the way I think uh, we as traditionalists would read and understand that, Chris, you're on the right track. And if I haven't emphasized that clearly enough, um, hopefully it will be emphasized uh, clearly uh, in, in this text as well. So um, please, uh, uh, feel free to jump in and ask those kinds of questions. I see uh, Matt has joined us. Welcome, Matt. And so let's just dive in and start going through these uh, these verses and talk through them, um, give some commentary, uh, make sure that we're not missing any key points here. As I already mentioned, he's just fed the 5,000, just walked on water. He's now pulled off to this other side here uh, um, in Capernaum and uh, there's where they're seeking Jesus. And, um, and this is where we pick up here in verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Now, I think it needs to be point, pointed out here. They did see the miracles. They saw the signs. What he's saying is you didn't understand the signs. And so I, I think what he's saying here is you, you um, you seek me not because you understood the meaning of the, the the miracles. You didn't understand them. And so you saw with your eyes, but you did not perceive what I was accomplishing and what I was doing. Um, but the reason you come is because you ate of the loaves and were filled. In other words, you're coming for more food. You're not coming because you understood the point of the miracle. You're not, you're not, you're not coming because you understood what my, my miracles were are testifying to and who I am and what significance I have. You're coming because you want your belly filled. You're coming to seek after more food. And, uh, and then that's when he kind of gives a rebuke. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life. In other words, don't pursue temporal food, pursue eternal food. Um, and so this is one of the points that I want to bring up first is the pursuit here. There is a pursuit that Jesus acknowledges. There's the pursuit for that which is eternal, and there's the pursuit for that which is temporal. Both of them are pursuits. And he's not saying don't pursue. He's saying pursue not the temporal, but pursue the eternal. Now, where else do we see this talked about? Um, one of the one of the controversial passages that are often brought up uh, in in talking through these these texts and the way we understand them is, of course, Romans chapter nine. There on the screen, verse thirty, when Paul concludes his own uh, his his own chapter here. In other words, this is his own commentary on Romans nine. He says, "What what shall we say then that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness?" Now, notice there's a pursuit going on right here. Isn't there? So he's not, he's not, he's not downing the pursuit. He's he's downing what you are pursuing. So he said, the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained it, even a righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, have not arrived at that law. In other words, much like the people here in John chapter six, they're pursuing something, but what they're pursuing is that which is temporal, not which that which is eternal. 
They are pursuing the law of righteousness. They have not arrived at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. In other words, they're not pursuing the eternal. They're pursuing the temporal because they're not pursuing it by faith, as though if, but, but though as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. And so the reason I bring this up is because much of the same principle, at least, is being covered here in John chapter 6, is that what he's saying is, do not pursue or work for the food which perishes, the temporal, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which is the Son of Man, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, the Father God has set his seal. In other words, Jesus is the one who's given the authority to bestow eternal life. It's through Christ that we have eternal life, and it's through faith in him. Um, so before we move on, just on that point, um, open up for comments. Uh, guys, feel free to, to unmute and jump in here, and I will look at the side chat as well and see if we've got questions. Go ahead. Not everybody at once. <laughs> we, I must be just doing such a good job. Y'all don't have anything you'd like to add to that. That's great. Okay. Yeah, you, you do a good job there, Layton. <laughs> Um, but, right. you know, the idea of offering food um, or offering signs, why offer signs if people are unable to pursue, if they're not able to seek? Um, you, you're offering them because you are wanting them to seek. And I think John chapter 5, you know, looking back, there is an in interesting choice that has to be made in verse 39 you know, is Jesus rebuking that crowd in John chapter five, or is he really trying to plead with that crowd? Is, is he saying, search the scriptures, which is kind of a plea, or is he saying, you're searching it, but missing it, which is just yeah. a rebuke. Right. Uh, and I, I really have seen in my own study of, of this, these passages is, is Calvinists, they tend to want to read them as, as Jesus is basically saying, there's no hope for you guys. Um, you're missing the signs. You're not, you're not really understanding. And, and that's because you've been locked into this inability from a predestination viewpoint. And, and that, I can't see that in Jesus. I see Jesus reaching out and providing all that's needed to draw everyone to a point of decision. Amen. Good word. Uh, critical thinker on the side chat there says um, that pursuit is all over the Bible. Uh, absolutely it is. You see this everywhere. When you begin to understand there is a pursuit that's talking about the race that we're running, the pursuit that we have, and uh, those who gain eternal life are pursuing through faith, not through works. And there is a difference, clear difference to, between those two. Um, Aaron adds in there, amen. That pursuit is also near, according to Romans 10, 8. Faith is near even to our hearts. In other words, it's right there. It's not far from us. It's not too difficult for us to grasp, which is what Romans 10 is quoting from out of Deuteronomy, I believe it's 30, correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, but but I but that that pursuit is right there. You're seeking him. He's not far from any one of us, as Acts chapter 17 says. You see this pursuit throughout all of the scripture. That's not something unique to any either the, these two verses. Um, and the more we look at it, the more we we see it. Um there, there's uh, one other Facebook user who says in John 6, just as the crowd had a hunger for the physical bread Jesus offered, they uh, so they ate until they were satisfied. They need to be given spiritual hunger, drawn so that they will want the spiritual bread. And so it seems like um, th this person's making the point that just like you have a physical hunger for food, there's also a spiritual hunger. Now, of course, within the debate between Calvinist and non-Calvinist is the, the, I guess the Calvinist would argue from the standpoint of total inability that no one has spiritual hunger, um, and that no one can have spiritual hunger. They will only have maybe spiritual repulsion or spiritual nausea towards the things of God, unless God gives them a spiritual hunger, i.e. effectually draws them or gives them new heart or new, uh, you know, a, a new spirit. That That's something I think they have to establish biblically. They don't, they, I don't think that they can establish that the enabling or the drawing through the gospel is insufficient because the Bible never says that. Um, the Bible says that one can become hardened are blinded to the truths of God, but not that they're born that way already from birth. And of course, uh, this particular user doesn't go that far as to promote one side or the other, but we're just pointing that out. I'm not sure where that particular person stands on the on the issue. Um, 
And so uh, Irenic says, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me is another place where we where he shows that all that they ha all have heard and learned from the Father because they aren't coming to him. Um, in other words, I, I think what Irenic is pointing to is the fact that if you listen and learn from the Father, you're hearing from the Father, you're fearing the Father, like the Old Testament saints of old would have been doing, obviously, um, then you will listen and learn and you will come to the, the Son. And so uh, that's I think we see that throughout the scriptures as well. Um, yeah, some people are asking why their name is not coming up uh, as Facebook users. Um, I think with... Um, Screen, StreamYard, you've got to click on that link that's up in the top of it, um, either, either on the YouTube page. The YouTube page, I think you can do it just as you are, but if you're on one of the Facebook pages, you've got to click that uh, and give permission for that, for the name to come up for those that are asking about that. So um, if there's any, no more comments, let's continue on with the text. It says, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the work, food which endures to eternal life. Um, and so we're about to get into manna, where he talks about the manna. But look at the parallel between these things. Manna is representative of the word, right? So you partake of the manna in the same way that you might partake of the word. The, the manna comes down from heaven. The word comes down from heaven. You're responsible to eat of the manna daily. And they made, they made it to where it was. you had to eat it each day and trust that each day because it wouldn't preserve from one day to the next. You had to eat the new manna that was provided each day. Well, the same way with the word. You, you pursue and you, you eat from the word. Well, what else besides manna is contrasted or equated with the word? Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is called the word. And so the word, manna, Jesus, all must be partake, partaken of, all must be pursued through faith, trusting in his daily provision. That's, I think, the, the, uh, 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 what, the, what the story is telling us here uh, in what Jesus is hinting at behind the scenes. Now, remember we talked about in Mark chapter four in yesterday's broadcast that he only spoke to those on the outside in parables um, and that he would bring his disciples aside, Mark chapter four, verses 33 through 35, he says, and then he would explain it to his disciples in person. Well, this is one of those times when Jesus is speaking somewhat parabolically, somewhat uh, with somewhat of a riddle here, talking about eating my flesh and drinking my blood. And you're gonna hear how they're gonna get angry at this. But remember, he explains these things to disciples. Well, what we're doing is we're walking through this. We're disciples. We're believers. And so we're explaining what is being meant behind these words because we get it now. But you got to remember in that audience, they're not really catching this. Even his own disciples sometimes aren't following his analogies and his parables. Okay. But we, many years later, obviously, and after exegeting texts and seeing these things explained to us through the apostles, we're getting it more fully. David, go ahead. Uh, well, I just say in over on uh, the live comments here, David Lewis had an interesting question uh, about the paralyzed man in John chapter five. Let's pull it up. That I thought we might want to address. Yeah. It says, did the paralyzed man in John five have the ability to obey the command of Christ to get up and to walk? Did he have to be healed before he could obey the command? Isn't that example of total inability? Um, we'll go. Uh, would one of you want to address that first or I can address it, whichever one. Yeah, I'm cool with uh, giving my thoughts on it. Go, go ahead. All right. Well, I mean, D David's a friend of mine. Uh, me and him debated back in November. Uh, and this is uh, an interesting question here because I think it shows both that, um, for, for, first of all, we have to note that there's not really, this is not used as an example of how soteriology works. So we have to be careful of that, of you know drawing parallels where scripture doesn't draw them. So I don't see anywhere that, you know, in the Bible where it says this is an example necessarily of how salvation works. So we would be careful there. But even then, uh, I still think that we could say that Jesus had enabled the man by healing him, uh, but he still had to be, obedient to um, that, to that innate or to Jesus's command, even after he'd been enabled. So it was his choice to get up and walk after he had uh, been enabled to walk. Now, of course, it's not a perfect analogy because I'm thinking maybe David Lewis here is seeing that as regeneration, the healing there, and that the regeneration would be preceding the obedience. But if we just see it as enablement, then none of us are going to have a problem with that. Right. Well, 
And and I would also just point out, just like we've we've said before, um, with regard to Lazarus in the grave, uh, Calvinists will often use Lazarus as an example of one who has to be quote unquote brought to life, regenerated in order to walk out of the grave. But of course, uh, reading through that narrative, it never makes a link between Lazarus and soteriology. That's just a link that the Calvinists draw into a narrative, and that's really a really poor way of doing. Um, and and of course, David may agree with us. It's a poor way of 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 um, building your theology upon a narrative. And I'm not saying David's doing that. I'm sure he builds his theology on other things and maybe uses Lazarus or the paralyzed man as an example of how he believes salvation works. But we just have to point out that neither the story of, nor the story of Lazarus specifically give us any kind of link to sociological order salutis or something of that nature. In other words, it never says in the same way that Lazarus was raised from the dead or in the same way that the paralyzed man was given new life. So too, uh, this is the way soteriology works or this is the way that you're saved. That's not the way that it has ever said. In fact, if we read the Lazarus story, we actually see that he actually says, well, I, I thank God that I was not here so that you could see this miracle and believe, which seems somewhat superfluous if uh, effectual regeneration is at work for the sign and wonder of raising somebody from the dead, actually helping these people to believe, because if they're not regenerated, then they couldn't believe even uh, the miracle. Um, and so the miracle actually doesn't help them to believe as Jesus seems to suggest that it would. Um, and so it, the, the story of Lazarus does not support, uh, at least in my estimation, the, that kind of, of uh, sociolo sociological worldview. And so um, keeping that in mind, any, anything else you guys wanna add to that, feel free. Uh, um, your your two uh, points in agreement. You don't need my third agreement to to make it any stronger, but they do use uh, illustrations to try to prove their doctrine. And and these stories in John, we know why they were put there. They were they were there not to teach soteriology. They were there to teach that Jesus is the Son of God, and that, and that He has that power. And that then yes, you should trust Him for your salvation. But those miracles were were put there uh, to teach us that he had he's the son of God. Absolutely. Well, and there's other stories of um, people being healed, and then I think he heals. I can't remember the exact story where he heals ten of them, and then only one of them comes back and thanks him, uh, and he says, "Where are the others?" And so, just because someone is is healed from something, doesn't necessarily mean that there's a heart change. It's a difference between being physically healed of something and being obviously uh, changed internally and um, and just assuming that there's some kind of effectual work that happens in the same way that someone is physically healed. I think it's a stretch. In fact, what we usually hear is something like your faith has healed you. And so it's the other way around. The, the woman touches the garment and says, well, your faith has healed you. Or, um, the, you know, the, the man comes to him and asking for, you know, healing. And the, Jesus looks at him and says, your faith has healed you. And so it's actually faith preceding the healing that takes place. Um, and so um, it, it simply does not work for uh, the Calvinist rendering of those texts to just to read onto them some kind of effectual working that happens before um, uh, before one can believe uh, or supporting an order salutis, in my estimation, at least. Um, OK, so it goes on in verse 28. Therefore, he said to him, and by the way, we will not probably get all the way to the end of the chapter knowing, <laughs> knowing how we go through this, but we're going to go as far as we can. And then maybe we can pick up it again at a later date if we need to. So, but verse 28, therefore, he said to him. What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Okay. Or we may do the works of God. Okay. So their question is, in other words, they're trying to, they're replying to this. Uh, do not work for the food which perishes, but he says, do work. In other words, work for the food which endures to eternal life. And so some may use this to say, oh, well, look, um, Jesus is promoting work salvation because he's saying, don't work for the food that perishes, but do work for the e eternal life. And some people actually, make this case and try to make this case that there is um, works unto salvation. Um, but I, I think it's pretty clear as we read through this and as we see the, through this, that faith is not considered by Jesus or by Paul a notorious work. Um, it, it's, it, there's still a pursuit, but it's a pursuit through faith or pursuit through law. And the, you're not denying that the fact that there's a pursuit but one is per, one is a pursuit of the work of Christ. One is a pursuit of your own righteousness and your own works. It doesn't mean that there's not a pursuit um, or there's not a, you know, a trusting in or partaking of. Um, therefore, he said to him, what shall we do so that we may uh, work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God 
that you believe in him whom he has sent. Now, what many, uh, and I'm not sure David Lewis or any other Calvinists that may be tuning in here um, would uh, would agree with this particular statement, but maybe we can ask. David, you can put in the side chat there if you would like to. Um, are you one of the Calvinists? Are you a type of Calvinist? Because not all Calvinists take this position. But are you the type of Calvinist that believes when it says this is the work of God, that you believe in him who sent me, that that this is um, this is a gift of God, effectually given by God for you to believe in him. In other words, some people read verse 29 of chapter six and think it means that this work of God, this means this God does the work to effectually cause you to believe. And that's what verse 29 is saying, is that faith is an effectual gift given to the elect people. And therefore this is the work of God means this is the, the effectual work of God that causes you to believe in whom he has sent. Um, David, is that the way you read verse 29 or other Calvinists that may be tuning in? I don't mean to just to single out David there, but any of the other Calvinists that may be on the chat, is that the way you would take verse 29? Because that's not the way all Calvinists take verse 29, just, just to be clear. Calvinists are not a un universal monolithic group uh, on this particular point. Um, Brian or David, um, do either of you know uh, is that what you have typically seen Calvinist argue from verse 29 or is that pretty David does say on the side chat I don't think that the grammar states that um, which is good um, I think he's correct it doesn't state that so that's that's yeah I've heard a few but it, it's not the general view especially since of the, the question they ask about the works of God I mean, and in their mind, they're talking about what should they do. And uh, and so Jesus is basically saying, this is what you should do. You should believe. Right. And, and even even the God, even Paul talks about obedience to the gospel. And and we've talked about this before. You know, faith is a work, but it's not a meritorious work. It's not it, it's it, it's not even a causative work. Um, you know, God has to cause the new birth through faith. Uh, faith doesn't cause it. it. It's not by faith, really. It's through faith. Yeah, and it seems like David uh, Lewis there on the side check agrees uh, as a fellow Calvinist. And so th that's good. Um, and and I'm glad for that because there have been a lot of Calvinists that I've run into over the years who try to use 629 to support the effectual gift of grace given to some people, uh, the gift of faith that's given to some people and not others. And I often, at times, ironically enough, I'll oftentimes point them to um, to John Cal to John Calvin's commentaries because he actually says there, you see the highlighted, those who infer from this passage that faith is a gift of God are mistaken for Christ does not show what produces uh, God produces in us, but what he wishes and requires from us. So that's from Calvin's commentary uh, there in and of itself. Um, it's also interesting that if you go on to read um he gives a good explanation here. Um, again, this is Calvin's commentary, but we may think it is strange that God approves of nothing but faith alone for the love of our neighbor ought not to be despised and the other exercises of religion do not lose their place in honor. So then though faith may hold the highest rank, still other works are not superfluous. The reply is easy for faith does not exclude either the love of our neighbor or any other good work because it contains all within itself. Faith is called the only work of God because it mean because by means of it we possess Christ and thus because the son and become sons of God so that he governs us by his spirit so then because Christ does not separate faith from its fruits we need not wonder if he make it to be the first and the last that you believe in him whom he has sent what is the import of the word believe we have explained under the third chapter it ought always be remembered that in order to have a full perception of the power of faith, we must understand what Christ is in whom we believe and why he was given to us by the Father. It is idle sophistry under the pretext of this passage to maintain that we are justified by works if faith justifies because it is likewise called a work. Now, notice that that's the point I really wanted to get to right there. Let me highlight that. To maintain that we are justified by works if faith justifies because it is likewise called a work. First, he explains, 
this is again Calvin explaining this. First, it is plain enough that Christ does not speak with strict accuracy when he calls faith a work. Now, I don't know that I would say that Jesus doesn't, Christ doesn't speak with accuracy. I don't know that I would put it that way. I would probably say faith, Christ is not talking about a notorious work when he calls faith a work. Just as Paul makes this comparison between the law of faith, this is a great point here, and the law of works there in Romans uh, chapter 3, verse 27. So um, this is of vital importance because when we talk about the law of faith versus the law of works, there's a separation there, and that's why you can't equate faith with a work, which some of our Calvinistic friends wrongly do. I've heard, actually, we got a clip from James White doing that, and we try to correct him on that point uh, because it's not by... Uh, faith is not just another work. Okay. So secondly, when we affirm that men are not justified by works, we mean works by the merit of which men may obtain favor with God. Okay. So he's separating the difference between justified by works of the law. We mean works by which the merit of which men may obtain favor with God. In other words, by following the commandments and doing all the right things and following the Mosaic law and all the 635, you know, commands of the Old Testament, trying to follow these meticulously, this, this yoke of slavery that's been put upon us that we try to earn God's favor through these good things. But he goes on to say, but now faith brings nothing to God, but on the contrary, places man before God as empty and poor. Okay. So he, he's again, Calvinist. This is John Calvin. I agree with some of what Calvin says. Okay. And I'm agreeing especially with this because he's making the point that I have to make to Calvinists who don't know any better. Now faith brings nothing to God, but on the contrary, places man before God as empty and poor, that he may be filled with Christ and his grace. That is, therefore, if we may be allowed the expression, a passive work to which no reward can be paid. And it bestows on man no other righteousness than that which he receives from Christ. Amen and amen. You know else who met who else makes this same argument under the 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 um, title is faith notorious? This is the name of the article is faith notorious, and and this is a article by in 1976 Pastor John Piper. Okay. Now, he was still a Calvinist back then, but he does not refer to Calvinism. He does not refer to irresistible grace. He does not refer to faith as being given as some effectual gift, though those are things that he teaches later and that he does apparently believe. But in this article, he goes through and he explains how faith is not considered a notorious work. And he says it in exactly the same way that I would say it. The reason we reposted this is because, as uh, Eric, I think, rightly explained here, let, let it never be said that we do not agree with a Calvinist when he is right. When a Calvinist is right, amen. We may amen the Calvinist. We say amen. But sometimes in our modern day, there are some Calvinists who don't know Calvin or they don't even know basic theology when it comes to things. Because here, here's something that Calvin recognized, and I think John Piper recognizes, is that even if you say that faith is effectually given to the elect, it doesn't escape the problem if you call faith a notorious work. Because if God is giving you faith, you're still responsible to act in it, even on Calvinism. And therefore, if you make faith a notorious work, then you have to say, we believe that people are saved by a notorious work. And Calvinists don't want to do that, even if they think that notorious work was given effectually by God. So they're not, they're not stepping into an error by calling faith a notorious work because they know better, because they know we're saved by grace through faith. And they don't want to say that we're saved by grace through a notorious work. So Piper knows better than to call faith a notorious work, whether we freely do it or we're effectually caused to do it by God. Either way, you can't call it notorious work. Uh, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, I mean, it's. I'm glad you read that section of John Calvin, and that's why many non-Calvinists actually say, oh, well, he agrees with us. Um, and yet, you know, he said very clearly that through faith, we become we we become sons of God. We receive Jesus Christ, and and uh, in their theology, they have regeneration, then faith, and then receiving Jesus Christ and becoming sons of God. The problem is, 
if you don't have Christ, you don't have life. That's what John says in 1 John 5, 12. He that has the Son has life. He that does not have the Son has not life. And so how can you have regeneration, which is supposedly life, and then get faith, and then get Jesus? You can't. You have to have life through faith. You have to get Jesus through faith, as Calvin said. And then he used the word passive, um, which, again, the Calvinist believes that your, your faith is not really an active work of your own will and mind. It's, it's really a, a gift that, that you have to irresistibly exercise passively to receive Jesus and uh, everything else that comes with it. And it just goes against um, Jesus talking to these unsaved people here at the lake and saying, this is the work you've got to do, that you should do, that you should believe. You know, mm -hmm. he's talking to unregenerate people saying you should believe. Right. Uh, not, not, hey, wait till God gives you faith that passively makes you believe, makes you accept. Right. Well, well said. Uh, and going back to the text here, uh, verse 29, Jesus answered them saying, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. So they say to him, what then do, what then do you do for a sign so that we may see, may believe in you? What work do you perform? In other words, prove it. <laughs> okay. You're, you're telling us to believe in you. You're the Messiah. Prove it. Do something miraculous. Make something disappear. Do hocus pocus. Do something. Do a sign and wonder. And of course, later, I mean, earlier he talked about it's a you know perverse generation that asks for signs and wonders because they're wanting something temporal versus looking for something eternal. They're still pursuing through their eyes versus through the heart, through the spirit. And so our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them the bread out of heaven to eat. So why is Jesus talking about manna? when they ask for a work, okay? Remember, manna is from heaven given to the people. And remember, manna is representative of the word. In other words, God gave them manna, which is a miraculous sign showing God's glory, showing God's provision. And so why would he, why would he be referring to the manna? He's showing them, this is the way God showed the people of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, which are, you're all familiar with. This is the way God showed a sign to them. And that's exactly what he's doing for you right now. He's showing you the word. He's showing you the manna. As written, he came to give them bread out of heaven to eat. Jesus said then said to them, truly, I say to you, truly, truly, I say to you. It is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes out, down out of heaven and gives life to the world. He is obviously referring to himself here and the parallel of manna in the old covenant that they would have been familiar with, which would have been a sign that is from God, that he himself is in sense taking a place of that manna. He is the word being given from the father. And so that's obviously the parallel that's taking place. Now, remember Mark chapter four, verses 33 through 35. He only spoke to them in parables. And yet then he pulls his disciples aside and explains it to them. We're explaining what he means by this. But the people there, they're hearing this and they're going, huh, what? They're not following it. They're not getting it. Okay. They're not following the logic, but we are. And that's why we're understanding. But you got to remember they're not because while you're reading this, then you have to understand where they're coming from and why they're reacting the way they do to these passages, okay? For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. So they're, they're not really following what he's saying because if they were following what he was saying, they would know he's the one they're talking about. So they would just go, you're the bread. You're the one who's good. Instead, they're saying, okay, where where is this bread? Can, can you can you find, t tell us where to go to find this bread. It's kind of like the woman at the well. That the water that you drink that men never makes you thirsty again. Where, where, where is this water? Instead of looking at him and saying, Oh, you mean you, Oh, you're the one we should be listening. You're the one we should be partaking of. We, you're the one we should be in, investing in right here. Instead, they're looking around still going, where is it? Where is it? So they're not getting it. They're still looking. Verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread. You're, you're not getting it. You're still looking right here. Look right here, guys. Look at me. I'm talking to you. I 
am the bread. That's what he's saying to them. Think of the power of that. Think about being in that moment. I am the bread. He who comes to me will not hunger. And he who believes in me will never thirst. Now, stop. Is this new? Is this something that the people of Israel would have never heard anything like this before? Is this brand new to them? Is this something they've never seen? It's not. Um, In fact, look at Isaiah 55 and see if you don't see some parallel here. Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. In other words, you still have to come. It didn't cost anything. It's free, but you still got to come and get it. Come and get this. Even if you don't have money, it's free. Free for the taking. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. In other words, how do you eat eternal bread? You listen. You listen carefully to me and thus eat, partake of what is eternal, not of what is temporal, and delight yourself in abundance. Notice verse 3. Notice their responsibility here. Incline your ear and come to me. This is what we talked about in Acts chapter 28 yesterday when we were talking about those who have closed their eyes and therefore they cannot see, hear, understand, and turn anymore. Why? Because they closed their eyes. Not because their eyes were born closed and they couldn't do any otherwise. They chose to close their eyes. They could have inclined their eye or their ear to hear and come. But because they closed their eyes, they are now ever seeing, but never perceiving, ever hearing, but never understanding. They have physical eyes, physical ears, but they cannot spiritually see or hear. Why? Because they have refused and have grown hardened and calloused, not because God rejected them from the foundation of the world, not because they've been imputed with some kind of moral inability from the fall of Adam. None of that's anywhere in the Bible. That's all imputed uh, or put onto the text by theologians years later. Um, That's just not there. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may have life or listen that you may live. So what's the order salutis there? It's the same order salutis as John chapter five, when he says, you refuse to come to me so as to have life. He doesn't say, I refuse to give you life for generation so that you would certainly come to me. He doesn't say that. John 540, he says, you have refused to come to me so as to have life. And exactly parallels Isaiah 55 here. Listen that you may live. Incline your ear and listen that you may live. Not, I will make you alive so that you will incline your ear and listen. The Bible never puts being made alive prior to listening and obeying or really uh, listening and believing. Never does it. Not once. I challenge David in the side chat. I challenge all Calvinists everywhere to find me one passage of scripture which clearly and unequivocally says that new life proceeds belief. Does it? Never does. Yet I can produce verse after verse after verse, which we've done in a broadcast before, about how we have faith unto new life, believe unto new life, to believe unto new life, that you, uh, that, that you give your heart or, you, or you, you confess as to get a new heart, as Ezekiel 18 says. The all order salutis is completely clear throughout the scripture that you are to, to, to put your trust in him as to receive new life, not the other way around. John 20, 31, as we've said, these things have been written so that you may believe and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So how are you getting life in his name? By believing. Believing comes first by faith that you're made a child of God, not the other way around. Okay. So Isaiah 53 still goes on. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may believe or listen that you may live, excuse me. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercy shown to David. Behold, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and the commander of the peoples. Behold, you will call a nation. Behold, you will call a nation you do not know. And a nation which knows not you not will run to you because of the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. So here's a direct command saying, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Doesn't that seem to imply that there is a time where he may not be able to be found anymore? 
because you, you, you refuse to seek him and you've grown hardened and you've grown calloused. And now he can't be found because you have, you have reached that point of no return where you've been cut off in your unbelief and in your rejection. And so that's why he's warning them call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways. Is that your responsibility? Is it the responsibility of the wicked to forsake their ways? Yes. And the unrighteous man's his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts, your thoughts. And we can go on. But I think Isaiah 55 is a great parallel passage of John chapter six and talking about how we are to, uh, to to incline our ear to listen. And that is partaking. That is the means of partaking of the manna of the word of Christ. Brian, jump in there. And, and the elect, uh, the ones who believe in, in election, uh, according to Calvinist, they, they have to take that passage and they have to make everyone that's being talked to there an elect person only. So let the wicked elect forsake his way. Let the wicked, uh, uh, the unrighteous elect, you know, th- let the one who's thirsty that's elect come and drink. Because those verses are not for anybody else, really, in their thinking. Th- those verses are only for the elect. And God and Jesus, when he said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, he didn't mean everybody. He, he just meant all the elect that are heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you rest. So, so you have to take the scriptures and say God is really being duplicitous in his call to everyone because he really doesn't mean I'm promising everyone these things right. if they come to me. Um, well said. Uh, there in the side chat, uh, David, um, or David, we're picking on you a little bit. I think you're a resident Calvinist that's posting on the side there a lot. And so we're, we're trying to engage with some of the things you may be asking. Um, you said, question, does, doesn't provisionism contradict uh, Isaiah 55, 11, because it says that God's word doesn't accomplish all it's sent to do. Well, that assumes that God's word is, is sent to accomplish effectual salvation, but that's not what we believe it's sent to accomplish. Um, matter of fact, my sermon at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary was on that very point. Um, so what, what is the word? What is the word? What is the, the word of God meant to accomplish? If it's meant to accomplish effectual salvation for certain individuals, then you're right. Calvinist is right. You won. But you can't assume that because that's begging the question. What's the word meant to accomplish? Well, let's let the Bible answer that question. John 20, 31. These things were written. That's the gospel. These things were written. Why? So that you may believe it. And that by believing you may have life in his name. So if the purpose of the gospel is to enable you to believe, then it's accomplished its purpose by enabling you to believe you're still responsible for what you do with it. So we're not striving to say, which is what you go on to say right here, because God wants to save some, but fails to do so. God's not wanting to effectually save people and failing to effectually save them on our view. Okay. So what you've done is you've taken Calvinistic lenses and you've imposed them onto provisionists. And you're saying, God's trying to effectually save somebody. Oh, but he just can't do it. Oh man, that weak God. That's not what we're saying. We're saying God has enabled people to make a free choice, has made the light abundantly clear for them, but they're free as to whether they accept or reject. They suppress the truth or they accept the truth. And so God wants people to freely come to him and he provides the means by which they freely come to him. He is not trying to effectually save people and failing. That that, that would be um, puppetry in our view. We would think that that's more robotic. We don't think that that's real love. It's like putting a potion on a woman to make her love you. That's not real love for us. Um, and I know you, you reject that analogy possibly, and you don't think that that's a good analogy, And think, but that's the way we see it. We see this effectual kind of working is not real love. We, we see that as more robotic puppetry, but maybe with sentient beings. And it doesn't seem real to us unless there's real choice as C.S. Lewis talks about. Matter of fact, David, I listened to one of your broadcasts today while I was running, and um, you were talking about how um, that Calvinists, like myself, never give a positive presentation of our theodicy. And that's just false. I actually play, uh, maybe even the very video clip you were critiquing, uh, uh, C.S. Lewis um, from Mere Christianity and his theodicy, his free will theodicy, is that the purpose God has is the purpose in giving freedom of the will, because freedom is what is necessary for real love and relationship worth having versus a toy world where he just pulls the strings 
and ultimately causes people's desire to love him or to reject him based upon, you know, some sovereign decree versus um, free free relationship and, and, and relationship worth having. So that's the way that we would respond to that. Um, and we'll never get through the text if we go through all of those uh, different questions. So we're going to we're going to dive back into the text here. Um, and keep an eye, guys, on the side chat. If you see some good questions that are worth engaging, we, we don't want to miss those. So let's make sure we do we see those. Um, so I'm the bread of life that comes I, if if uh, comes to me. He who comes to me, so that's your responsibility. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. Okay, so. He's speaking to an audience, mostly obviously a Jewish audience. You've seen me. You've seen the signs that I've performed. You've seen these things and you're not believing. Um, we see this also over in John 12. That we've looked at before, beginning down in verse 39-ish, I think it is. Though he performed many signs, verse 37 of John chapter 12, he performed many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. So same kind of situation as you see in John 6, right? You're not believing. You see me. You don't believe. You've seen the signs. You're not believing. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes. He has hardened their heart so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted and I heal them. So what does the reason Jesus says they will not believe? Because he actually asked this, for this reason they could not believe. Does he say because they were born with a condition um, ontologically from birth due to the fall of Adam, where they had this moral incapacity, this blindness, spiritual blindness that they could not see? Or does he specifically refer to a prophecy about Israel in specific? Does he refer to them being judicially cut off and blinded due to their rebellion against him? I think it's pretty clear. And this is why we looked at uh, Acts chapter 28 so intently is to show the rebuke he has to Israel. You won't, he says, some will convince, some won't believe. And then he says, you're ever seeing, never perceiving. Your heart has grown callous. You have closed your eyes. Otherwise you might see here, turn and believe, and I would heal you. Therefore, I take the message to the Gentiles. He contrasts the Gentiles and they'll listen. So how in the world can it possibly be that everyone is born in this condition if he's just contacted the Jew with the Gentile who J Jews are being hardened because of their continual rebellion against the things of God? They have grown callous. They've not listened and learned from the Father through the Old Testament texts that have been made clear to them. So now they can't hear from the Son who's pe preaching the same truth that the Father's been preaching all these years, and they no longer can hear anymore because their heart has grown calloused. So the reason they can't believe is not because of some condition they're born with. The reason they can't believe is because they are Jewish people who have grown callous to the things of God and they have they have grown hardened to his truth so much so that they can't recognize their own Messiah when he's right in front of them. And that's the context that we see this in. And we have to understand that in order to understand the meaning of the text. Um, Moving along here, feel free to jump in if you're I'm missing something there, guys. Um, verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. Okay, so let's talk about this because when we talk about people that the Father is giving to the Son, what is that talking about? We talked about that a little bit yesterday uh, Bron Wagner and I did with John chapter, uh, excuse me, with um, uh, with regard to Mark four and the the whole concept that's going on there and and John seventeen especially, okay, because John seventeen is another place where he mentions the Father giving people to the Son, okay. Few things you can't assume, um, you can't assume that the Father is giving somebody to the Son arbitrarily. And when I say arbitrarily, I mean by the strictest definition of the word without any uh, seemingly random, um, but but it may not be really random in your view, I understand that, but seemingly random. Like it's just like, there's just no reason for it. And we just don't know what the reason is or it's some secret reason that's only contained within the sovereign one, the, the God's eternal secret 
you plan. And then he's just like giving these to the son. Just, I, we don't know why he, he gave, gave Brian to the son and he gave David to the son and he gave Leighton to the son, but Hitler, he just didn't give him. We don't know why he just, we just know he did. And then we just trust him. And who are you to question him? If you do, you know, is that, is that what he's talking about here? Or is he talking about the fact that he would give to the son, those who have faith in the father. <laughs> okay. Follow this. Okay. People who believe in the father, who is the same as the son. Remember they're united. John's all over John. If you believe the father, you'll believe the son, but those who believe trust in the father, like Cornelius, like Lydia, like other people of this day, people who believe in the Father, he's going to give them to the Son. Okay? So it's not an arbitrary or unconditional secret reason. It's the Father takes those who believe in Him, trust in Him, gives them to the Son, and trust them to the Son. Um, and so you've got to ask yourself, which one of those two is most likely in the mind of Jesus when He's saying this? Given the context, speaking to a Jewish audience who, generally speaking, again, I speak generally because the Bible speaks generally, the Jewish people, generally speaking, have grown calloused and hardened to the things of God because they're old wineskins that can't take the new wine. They have been listening to the Pharisees too long, and they have come to misunderstand the truth of who God is. Jump in there, Brian. Yeah, as I pointed out a couple of days ago, uh, you know, Calvinists miss every time that Jesus says the Father gives me, not has given. He does use past tense later on, but here he uses present tense indicative, all that the Father is now giving me will come to me. And so, therefore, you know, Christ, you would be calling Jesus a deceiver, really, to suggest that all had been given to him in the past, and yet he's using the present tense. In other words, he, he should have said, all that the Father has given me will come to me. That's the Calvinist mentality. That's the termin right. deterministic mentality. But he doesn't say has given. He says, all the Father is giving me will come to me. And, and so either he didn't know, either Jesus didn't know his deterministic teaching very well, or, or he, he knew that, you know, and, and then the question is, how is the father giving? As you pointed out, the father is giving to Jesus the ones who are believing, the ones who are seeking, the ones who are pursuing, uh, the ones who have already been taught by the father, like you said, and have, have accepted that teaching. Those are the ones the father is presently giving to Jesus. And so later on, when he says past tense, those that had been given to me, well, yeah, <laughs> they were the, those were the same ones that were given to Jesus during that time period. Uh, Nathan mentions here too, comparing John six thirty nine with John seventeen twelve seems to be the disciples or those who were following the Father are being given to the Son. That's exactly the point we were we were saying, um, and th that does seem to be more realistic. And plus, when when you look at the context of what's happening, remember. The Gentiles aren't even in view yet, okay? It's not to say the Gentiles aren't important yet, but remember, it, Jesus comes to his own first. His own receive him not, remember? Um, but he, he comes to the, the house of Israel first, just like the, the parable of the wedding banquet. You take the invitation first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And it's not until Paul is called out as the apostle to the Gentiles. And Peter, you remember, he has the dream right before he goes to Cornelius's house of the white sheet that's less let down. And he's finally, he finally realizes, Oh wait, the gospel is not just for the Jew. It's also for the Gentile. Remember that's later right now. It's just, it's just, this is a Jewish thing happening. And he's a Jew. He's got a Jewish audience here that he's speaking to. And among that Jewish audience, most of them generally speaking are hardened and callous to the truth because of, of the Pharisees teaching and this, just this misunderstanding of the, of the they have a veil over their eyes as, as the, Paul puts it in, uh, in to the letter to the Corinthians. You have a veil over their eyes, but he also says, if you turn to the Lord, the veil will be removed. So you, your responsibility is to turn to the Lord so as to have the veil removed. But if you don't turn to the Lord, if you don't turn to Christ, then you have this veil over your eyes because you just can't see what's happening. You can't understand what's taking place because you're not seeing your own Messiah. And so um, as, as Nathan points out here, those given to the sun while down from heaven, that's contextually present tense. That's what Brian is pointing to there is the reason we look at the present tense is that right now, while he's on earth, 
He's not entrusting himself to everyone. He's not trying to draw thousands upon thousands like we see at Pentecost and Peter preaches and 3,000 come to faith. If that happened right here in John chapter 6, they would have never crucified a rabbi with 3,000 ardent, spirit-filled followers. Never, They couldn't have. It wouldn't have happened. The, in order for him to accomplish his purpose, as 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8 says, that these things were hidden, that had they known these things, they would never have crucified the Lord, Lord of glory, that he keeps things in parabolic language, using riddles oftentimes, keeping them at a distance, even as chapter 2 of John says, he doesn't entrust himself to many of them, even though they were following and wanting more signs and more wonders, he wasn't entrusting himself to them. When he saw earlier in the chapter, we see this where when they saw when he saw them trying to make him into the king and trying to lift him up and trying to say, "Oh, look, let's make him our our new um, leader," uh, he pulls away from them and hides from them and gets alone. He he doesn't. He's pushing that away because it's not his take. He continues to say throughout both of these chapters because it wasn't the right time yet. It wasn't the right time yet. It's about his strategy here to accomplish Calvary. So through all of this, we see a strategy that, that Jesus is ultimately accomplishing through using parabolic language and through not revealing himself. And only certain individuals that God has appointed, chosen, um, as Acts chapter 10, verses 39, 40, 41, Paul talks about. He didn't reveal himself to everyone as he, after he was resurrected, but only those who ate with him, those who were chosen beforehand, the way Peter puts it. Talking about specifically his apostles and those closest to him, that are being entrusted to Christ to be the one who carries uh, the, the message to the rest. Now, some people hear my explanation of this, like James White did. And what they walk away with is they say, oh, so Leighton, you believe this is only about the apostles and has no application to us whatsoever. No, okay? That's, that's not what I'm saying. Um, and please get this, because I, I think this is so valuable to understand this. You have to understand things within their context properly in order to apply them to yourself properly. And so while Jesus may be speaking to Peter individually after he denied him three times, does that mean there's no principles that we can draw from that as Christians today? Well, of course not. Um, obviously, if we, we've had a, a moment of backsliding or if we've denied Christ through our actions and our words, then reading through the story of Jesus and his, his his speaking to Peter after the denial would be very valuable. But that doesn't we mean we we say, oh well, we we can't look at the fact that his audience was Peter. Obviously, the audience was Peter. That doesn't change the principle behind the truth of what he's saying to Peter. And in the same way, just because we know he's speaking to the people of Israel who have grown hardened and calloused, doesn't mean that there's not principles that would apply to us two thousand years later. But we have to understand him in his context in order to take those principles and apply them to us correctly today. And what we have to understand is that these are Jews who've largely, for the large part, have become calloused and hardened to the things of God, have been given over to their spirit of stupor, if you will, eyes that they cannot see, ears that they cannot hear. They've stumbled, but not beyond recovery, according to Paul, but they are in a stumbling posture. They are they're not hearing and seeing who their Messiah truly is because of their unbelief. Um, and, and God is using that Christ is using that as a part of his strategy to accomplish Calvary. And once we understand that, the, these, these texts seem to flow, uh, at least my estimation, uh, much more smoothly. Anything else you want to get, you guys want to add to that before we move on? Brian, go ahead. Well, just coming out from the context, John is adding this story of John chapter six to, to teach Calvinism. I mean, is that to teach determinism? No, the, the story has to fit in with the overall purpose of the book, which is that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, believing you might have life in his name. So so why put a story in there that's basically saying he doesn't really want everybody? He, he, just, he just has a few special ones he's drawing. No, no Jesus is explaining that you better, you better accept the drawing when you get it. That's, that's what he's explaining to the crowd that day. And uh, and so the yeah. person who's reading the book of John, sixty years later, this story is to encourage him not to say, "Well, I might not be one of the elect." No, this this story is to encourage him to not reject like those people did to accept, to accept Jesus. Yeah, go, go ahead, John, uh, David. Yeah, and to follow off Brian's point there about following the main themes of the book, uh, I think we do have a main theme in the. Gospel of John of uh, theme of light and darkness that we see right from the beginning of Jesus uh, being the light that comes into a dark world. 
And uh, even in John 3, we see that, uh, you know, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. But he who does the truth comes to the light. And so we see here that there are, at least as far as the Gospel of John is concerned, we have people who are interested in following the light that God has given them and people who are rejecting it. And so that when that light comes into the world, uh, when, you know, the, the fullness of God is revealed in Jesus the Son, then people will come to that based on their love that they have already developed by responding to um, the light that God has already given them. So we have people living in right covenant relationship here. And Robert Hamilton, uh, in his article on, on Gospel of John, does a really good job of demonstrating how um, that interpretation makes so much sense out of the Gospel of John, uh, chapter six included, but also even like John eight and 10, where like, um, you know, uh, you're not my sheep and, and statements like that. Uh, and that this also finds a lot of support in the Old Testament. Even in the Old Testament, we're told that when the Messiah comes, he's going to uh, gather his sheep together, the remnant of his sheep. And uh, so, you know, when we see that people, you know, being given to the Father, um, you know, being, being given them of the Father to come in John chapter 6, uh, we can see this is in response to choices that they have already made. Uh, and this is not, nowhere does the Gospel of John ground this in some kind of unconditional eternal decree of God to save some and damn others. That explanation is without merit anywhere in Scripture, certainly without merit in the Gospel of John. And uh, yeah, so they just they, they have to demonstrate that that is the reason why uh, some are given to Christ and some are not. And I don't think they can do that. Well said. Um, yeah. Kudos. That's good. Verse 37. Going back to that, we've already just stated it and we'll say it again. All that the father gives me. So in other words, those who've listened and learned from the father given to the son, they will come. Cornelius, when he hears the this, this story of Jesus, he's going to come. Why? He's a God-fearing man, loves the Lord, okay? Why wouldn't he come? Because I and the Father are one. And when I speak, I speak the Father's words. And so people who've been listening to the Father, they're gonna listen and learn from the Son. That's just a natural thing. So all the Father gets me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. Cornelius comes to me, am I gonna cast him out? Of course not. Why would I cast him out? Because he's a Gentile? No, I, whoever comes to me, I will no wise cast out. And the reason I, I would they would come to me is because they are listen and learn from the Father, and the Father gives them to the Son. I mean, when, when you understand this, it flows so simply, and you don't need the baggage of unconditional election to effectual salvation and God reprobating most of humanity, but hating quote unquote salvifically hating people before they're ever born, and all of the baggage and the the the, the, the split that happened in the church in the fifth century when it was first introduced by a former Manichaean Gnostic from North Africa. I mean, all of this stuff doesn't have to be, it's just not, it's just not necessary guys. It's just not a necessary reading of the text to go that far. Verse 38, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now, the reason I point this verse out even specifically is because look at the context as Brian was pointing out earlier. This is present tense. He's, he's come down now. He's here now for a reason. And so what he's doing right now, speaking to the Jewish people who are hardened and callous for the most part, and the Father has given him a select few to train them up and to teach them, that's that's part of the context of what he's speaking into here. He's not entrusting himself to everyone. He's not revealing the truth to everyone at this time. But while he's down from heaven, he's not doing his own will. He's doing what God's told him to do. He's not speaking his own words. He's speaking the words that the Father has given him, which is important for the reason that we've talked about before. That if you've listened and learned from the father of old, if you listen to Abraham, you would believe me, which is what he says, what, in chapter 8? It's what he says to the Pharisees. If you listen to Abraham, you would believe in me because Abraham spoke of me. If you look to the scriptures and you believed in the scriptures, you would believe in me because the scriptures testify to me, is what he continues to say over and over again. Um, verse 39, this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose none or nothing but raise it up on the last day. Now you can see how a Calvinist, if you have a Calvinistic lenses, the duck rabbit thing we talked about before, if you have those lenses on, you read a verse like this and you go, okay, the sovereign will of him who sent me is that all he has effectually chosen, all he's unconditionally chosen and effectually given to the father, the son through irresistible grace. Those are the ones he's not going to lose and he's going to raise them up on the last day. You can see it, can't you? I want you to see the Calvinistic lens. I want you to see it the way they see it. 
The reason they're so vehement about defending this, they believe that's what God's word is saying. They believe this is what Jesus is saying. The will of Jesus that was sent by the Father is that everyone who is effectually given to him by the Father through irresistible grace, those are the ones he's going to raise up and he's going to certainly save them. You can see how they might interpret that, right? So take off the Calvinistic lenses and I'll put on different lenses, put on the provisionist lenses and try to see it from our perspective and be objective, okay? This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that believe, listen and learn from the Father, all who came to the Father are given to me and I'm not going to lose any one that come to me. I'm not, I'm going to raise them up. I'm going to save all that the father gives me through faith by grace, through faith. And so there's nothing in this verse that's uniquely Calvinistic. It depends on how you're reading the verse. What presuppositions are you reading onto the verse? If you're reading the Calvinistic presuppositions, presuppositions on the verse of unconditional election before creation and irre, irresistible grace, then yeah, it sounds like 639 is teaching Calvinism. But if you take out those two presumptions and you don't presume unconditional election and uh, irresistible grace, then nothing about that verse says anything that's uniquely Calvinistic. Um, and so you've got to be willing to objectively step away from your lens and your your your, your tradition and your, um, your own uh, bias and say, okay, what was the author meaning in his context? What was he addressing there? Because he's not addressing a group of people who are totally disabled from birth due to the fall of Adam. He is addressing Israelites who've grown hardened due to their own choices and rebellion against the things of God. That and that alone disproves the Calvinist premise of total inability. If you just simply understand the context of who he's speaking to and why they're not believing. Verse 40, for this is the will of my father that everyone who what? Everyone who was effectually chosen before the foundation of the world. No. Everyone who beholds the son and believes in him will have eternal life. So that there's the, the responsibility that we have to behold the son, to believe in him. That's the, that's, and that's the question he asked earlier in, in verse 25, 26, 27, when he asked the question, what is the, what is the work that you, God requires? The work God requires Believe in him so as to have eternal life. And again, notice that believing precedes life here. Otherwise, the Calvinist has to make eternal life a different kind of life than regenerative life. And so this is one of the reasons that you have Calvinists with two different callings, two different kinds of love, two different kinds of will of God. They, they, the only way they can do this is to help to keep their, their, their perspective from being falsified. Because anytime you find a verse that falsifies their view of will or call or love or those kinds of things where they can just say, well, that's a different kind of will. That's a different kind of love. That's a different kind of life. D is regenerative life eternal life or not? I, I just have to ask a Calvinist that. When a person's regenerated, is that eternally impactful life or not? Because I can't imagine you would say that somebody can be regenerated without having eternal life. How, on a what basis, biblical basis, do you separate, quote unquote, regenerative regeneration from what is called eternal life. Because that's the way Calvinists get around verses like this and John 20, 31 that I quote quite regularly is they say, well, there's two different kinds of life. There's eternal life, yes, but there's also regenerative quickening that happens before. And I'm just like, okay, well, is there anywhere in the Bible that these things are pointed out so that we could talk about them? Brian? Yeah, I mean, how, how can you have the life without having Christ, as I said earlier? And how can you have regenerative life, which is the born again spirit, uh, born of the spirit, experience and not be a child of God. I mean, they have, you have a born again experience, but you're not a child. So there's a birth without becoming a child that I don't know how that works. Yeah. I, I, you, you got me too. I'm not sure how that would, uh, that would compute. Um, so this is the will of the father that everyone who beholds the son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the, the last day. Um, verse 41, therefore the Jews were grumbling about him. So why were they grumbling about him? Because some, some Calvinist, and I've heard this on a sermon the other day I was listening to from a Calvinist, not nobody you probably heard of, but Calvinist friend that I know that was teaching out of John six. And he said, 
They're grumbling because of Calvinism. That's <laughs> what he's ultimately, he concludes. He said, they're grumbling because I've j he's just taught Calvinism. And now they're grumbling. He says, isn't that just like our world today? People grumbling about Calvinism. And, and he, he ultimately puts the Calvinist in this, this group of 40, verse 41 right here, is that we're Arminian grumblers. We're the non-Calvinistic grumblers. And they're we're grumbling, grumbling because they're Calvinism. getting any more fish and bread. That's what they're grumbling about. <laughs> Exactly. They're grumbling because they're Baptist and want their, they want their food. That's, that's what I would say. This is where's the potluck? Come on. I mean, where's the, where's the, you haven't had my fill of food yet. It had nothing to do with them rejecting this concept of, of, of Calvinist theology. Um, so verse 41, it says, therefore, the Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. And so they're, they're, they're more, if anything, they're grumbling because of they see something as bla blasphemous here. He's saying he's from God. But remember, that's the reason he goes to the cross. You remember? Blasphemy. He's claiming to be of God here. He's claiming anybody who claims to be God um, is going to get killed in that day, especially. Right. And so that's that's what they're grumbling about. They're grumbling about his blasphemous statements, um, which, again, proves that the, the whole argument of C.S. Lewis is that either he's Lord, liar, liar or lunatic. Um, you don't kill a guy who's a, who's a lunatic and who's just crazy. You just put him out on the street and let him beg for money. Um, clearly, they thought he was a liar, a blasphemous liar claiming to be God. And that's why he got killed. Um, and so that's why they're grumbling because he says, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. Um, they were saying, this is not, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph whom the father and mother we know? Uh, this is kind of like the prophet is not welcome in his hometown. We know this guy. We saw him when he was a little kid. Remember when he was running around in the street out here? We, we know who this kid is. They're, we're not going to know where the Messiah comes from and we're not gonna know who his parents are. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's pretty much what they're saying here. How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? Again, they're they're about to, you know, you can almost feel it within them. It's, it's blasphemy. And they're about to pick up the rocks kind of a thing, situation kind of a thing here. Uh, verse 43. Jesus answered and said to them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. So how does this relate to what we talked about yesterday with Mark chapter four? Because remember Mark chapter four, he speaks to them parabolically in riddles and he only speaks to them in riddles according to verse 33 and 34. And then in verse 35, he says he pulls his disciples aside and he explains what he means by the riddle. In other words, he gives them what they need to know. That he explains what he's what he's what he's meaning. You can't believe in something you don't understand. And the people in this audience, they're not getting it. They're not following it. They're still like they're looking around for the bread. Hey, where, where's the potluck? Where's the food? Um, now you're saying you're bread from heaven, and you say you're from heaven and you're from God. They're not following his meaning. They're not understanding him. Okay. And therefore you cannot come to me unless the father who sent me draws you. In other words, unless you have learned from the father, unless you've been listening to the father, you're not going to be coming to me. You're not going to listen from me. You're not going to understand my words. My words are going to be babble to you. They're going to be riddles to, to you. You're not going to get it. And I will raise up that person who comes to me on the last day. Now, this is one of the verses, obviously, that's most quoted by the Calvinist. And oftentimes, I just wish they would read verse 45 with it, just so people could get the context a little bit more clearly. Because look what he says. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught of God. Who is, who is, who is they? Those who come. They shall be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father... There's the hearing and the learning right there. Everyone who's heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So you can't separate verse 45 from verse 44. Because who are the ones who come to him? The ones who've listened and learned from the Father. They listen and learn from the Father. The Father, therefore, gives them to the Son, trolls them. And those are the ones he's going to raise up on the last day. Now, when people like James White hear me explain this, they say, oh, again, you're just talking about, you think it's all about, uh, the, the apostles of that day and the disciples and the Jews of that day. No, I'm just pointing out that's the audience that he's speaking to. I'm pointing out the condition of the audience that he's speaking to, that they're hardened Jews that cannot, that haven't been listening and learned from the father for the most part. And therefore are not going to be given to the son drawn to him. 
and therefore won't be raised up unless they do start listening and learning from the father and they do uh, come to the son. Um, and so you, you have to see the context as a whole. Now, we've pointed this out before um, there at the website where uh, this verse is oftentimes just pulled out of its context and you really focus on this. It makes it sound like Calvinism. And again, with the lenses of Calvinism on, it, it does sound like Calvinism because if you come with the premise of the Calvinistic soteriology, then this sounds like it's it's saying uh, that you need irresistible grace in order to uh, overcome this this you know this un, you know, this deadness that has to be you know we have to be drawn out of. Go ahead, uh, Brian. Uh, yeah, I don't know how much time you want to take on this one. I, I have um, a long discussion of this word "draw." You know, looking at the New Testament uses of it, and also even the Old Testament Septuagint use of this word. And uh, I, I just think, you know, even if you keep the word drag as, as the meaning, uh, it's, dra it's being, you're being dragged to a point or you're being dragged to a place. Um, and then you have to decide. You have to decide what you're going to do. And it's used in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 30 of Israel being, being drawn by God. And they refused. They, they, they uh, rejected. Uh, well, interestingly, and I'll, I, I don't mean to interrupt you because I want you to go ahead with what you're saying. So keep keep your place there. But um, in in the R.C. Sproul debate, uh, he, he references the word helco, which is the word uh, in Greek for draw. And he quotes other times it's used and he talks about it uh, dragging in a, a, a great net of fish. And he says this is the dragging kind of thing. Um, but interestingly enough, in one of those verses, it talks about the fact that they tried to drag it, but couldn't. In other words, uh, even Helco, uh, used in the most strict uh, literal language of not draw, but drag, uh, doesn't always mean it's done irresistibly or it can't be resisted because obviously the net, the net was too uh, too great to be drawn, to be drug in. Or, or, that, or that there's a difference, you know, you have to maintain the difference between dragging and coming. Dra you need dragging before you can come. Okay, I agree. The father has to drag. But that doesn't mean you're guaranteed to come, that there might not be other steps in between. And when you look in the context, you know, who does he raise up? He raises up those who come, not just those who he drags. He raises up those who come, those who look to him, those who believe in him. These are, these are all verses where I will raise him up at the last day. Are are um, are given those conditions, if you want to use that expression. But how about Paul and Silas? They were they were drugged before the um, tribunal there in Philippi and thrown into prison. And uh, but then they had a decision to make: Are they going to cry all night and 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 mourn for their their situation? No, they 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 made a decision. They were going to sing and pray. <laughs> and, and so. So, you know, God does, I, I believe with all my heart, God does drag everyone with his light, creation, conscience, messengers. He drags everyone to a point of decision. And then they have to decide, am I going to keep seeking? Am I going to, am I going to refuse? Um, they have to, they have to decide, am I going to trust this light that I've been drugged to see? Yeah, and, and of course, John twelve thirty two speaks to that as we talked about, and that would fit better that term Helco there in John twelve thirty two that if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself, uh, which would be universalism if the word dragged there is used, uh, unless you the Calvinists impose that that's supposed to mean that God drags all types of men, but if he wanted I, to say I'd all say the word to himself is the is the bigger key. I think he does drag everyone. This is the true light, which enlightens every man. He drags everyone to himself, and then they have to make a decision. Yeah, and that's kind of what I, th I think someone on the side check was saying. Uh, I guess it's Aaron here that says drawing gets a man to Christ. Faith gets a man in Christ. And so he's kind of making that same kind of a point there that they're, they're, it's, it's you need to be. A preposition cross, which right. uh, really means to be in front of. Uh, right, which. To which to, um, to draw to him. Which. It goes along with the concept and idea of the invitation to the wedding banquet is that you you can't go to the party without the invitation. But once you get the invitation, you're responsible for what you do with it. So the invitation would be like the enabling or the drawing, but you're responsible as to what you do once drawn or once enabled. Um, and you reject the wedding garment. 
<laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Which is what we talked about uh, the other day on the, the last broadcast, if you haven't listened to that. Um, so looking at um, this this one more time, if, if you looked at the Calvinist next to the traditionalist or the provisionist like myself, kind of uh, changing the words to what they literally mean, most literally. And I know Calvinists wouldn't all use the word drag. They might use the word compel or irresistible grace or something like that. But you, you, you get the picture. Um, no man can come to me unless the father who sent me drags him. So this man right here, this is the, in the, in the masculine tense here. So no man can come unless the father sent me drags that man. And I will raise up those men who were dragged at the last day. And so there's, there's, there's the masculine, 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 all right here forms of the verbs. And so that's the way the Calvinist would, would kind of link the, these things together. Um, the way that I, I would more likely read it is no, that no man, again, no man can come unless the Father who sent me enables him. Now, I know the word draws is fine with me. I like the word draws. I, I like it. I'm just using the word enables here as to distinguish very clearly what I mean by it. Um, because drawn can be taken as some kind of irresistible thing if you want to think of it that way, whereas the word enables really can't. Enables just means I'm enabling, I, you know, enabling somebody to come to the party by giving them the invitation, enabling my son to take out my car by giving him the keys. Um, he's still responsible for whether he does that or not. Um, uh, so enabling somebody. And interestingly, in, in verse, what is it, 65, uh, the word enables is the word that Jesus uses later on. So this word is not without precedent. It's the word that Jesus uses in his own commentary. Uh, from the word dunamai, which is to enable, to give one the ability to do something. And so no one can come to the Father unless he's given the ability to, or he's enabled to. Um, and I will raise him who comes on the last day. And so the reference here is not to the quote-unquote irresistible dragging, but the quote here is referencing to the, the man in general saying, the one who can come, they can't come unless they're enabled. And the, the one who does come is going to be raised up on the last day. The Greek, and again, Brian, you're the Greek teacher here, the Greek professor. Um, the Greek does not get specific enough to indicate this is the way it should be read or this is the way it should be read. The only way we can know the way it should be read is by looking at the entire context. That's why I think verse 45 is so important because the verse 45 and chapter 12, verse 32, when the word is used again, all by Jesus, gives us the context to understand which of these is the most likely reading and meaning of the text. Go ahead, Brian. You're muted. Yeah. There you go. Go uh, both sides, our side and their side, have to make an assumption on this verse. Right. Um, the, the assumption being, you know, that one side thinks the drawing must result in coming. And the other side thinks the drawing only enables coming, which is what he says. You can't come and you're not able to come unless you're drawn. Uh, but we say that's all it says. You're not able to come unless you're drawn. And um, but then there's other verses right in this context. You know, they want to they want to link. He raises him up at the last day to the drawing. They don't want to link. He raises him up at the last day to the coming. But they have to because there's other verses that say there's other things that are involved in in being raised up in the last day. You know, there's there's believing verse forty, uh, which we haven't got. Have we gotten that? Yeah, we passed verse forty already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him may have everlasting life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. So, so it can't be just dragging. It has to also be the person who is believing and and the person who is seeing. Um, and then we, later on, he's going to say, whoever drinks my, eats my flesh and drinks my blood has e eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So, so it can't just be dragging. It has to be these other conditions being met. And, uh, and so there, in those conditions, there is that personal response to the dragging, to, to the offering of, of him to eat and drink, <laughs> and to, to seeing him and believing in him. Right. Those personal responses are our are, are, are personal responses are, are our part. And I've heard one one non-Calvinist make the argument, and I, I'm going to try to confuse people here because like there are different types of Calvinists who make different arguments, there are obviously different types of non-Calvinists that make different arguments. 
And um, and remember, when in apologetics, you you they're called defeaters. And so you're saying, well, here's two possible interpretations that counter the Calvinistic interpretation. Um, and, and and one of the non-Calvinistic interpretations says, well, even if you were to say draws here is an irresistible form of the verb. Um, in other words, those who are drawn are specifically those who are going to be raised up in specific, um, that the text could be read to be meaning more specifically those who are already believing ones being drawn to the sun through some kind of effectual means. In other words, these are these are people who already had faith, like Cornelius in that sense, and therefore they're going to be effectually given to the Son through some kind of, of, of working of God's grace. Um, I don't necessarily see that that has to be the case, but I can understand that argument, that even, even taking the word draws in the strictest compelling sense is still not enough to get you to Calvinism. It, it's enough to show you that the, the work of God giving uh, Peter to Cornelius is is going to be um, uh, is going to be a compelling type of thing, um, and it's going to be you're going to be very compelled to believe in Jesus if you've listened and learned from the Father. Um, but you don't you don't have to have um, Calvinism even if you accept a compelling nature of the word helco here. Um, that that's the point that's being made. So both of those serve as defeaters for the individualized, westernized, Calvinistic take of God choosing certain individuals before the foundation of the world for no apparent reason and effectually drawing them and giving them to the Son arbitrarily in that kind of a sense. Um, and again, I know that's not the way the Calvinists would want to delineate the way that happens, but um, I don't think it's inaccurate in, in, in the description of it. Um, so continuing on, verse 46 goes on to say, not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Now, notice the order again. It's those that's the believing ones who have eternal life. Um, so again, believing precedes the life in the, these, these contexts. It always does in every context, by the way. Um, at least that I'm aware of. I've never been shown uh, a verse that <laughs> puts it in the other, other order. Um, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down from heaven so that, that one may eat of it and not die. So the eating is what leads to the life, the eternal life. You eat, you partake. And what is partaking? Remember from Isaiah 55, the partaking is incline your ear to hear and listen so as to, to receive life. Um, verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also, which I give for the life is of the world of the world is my flesh. So if you want to talk about atonement and the extent of the atonement, here's a good verse to go to. I will give life for the world. The life of the world is my flesh. In other words, this is a provision for all, yet it's only beneficial for those who are partaking of it. So bread, the manna, comes down from heaven to all. It only benefits those who partake of it. Okay, so um, it's a provision. It's the the serpent lifted in the desert. Okay, provided for all. It only benefits those who look to him for healing, and in, in faith. And so um, it, a provision can be made for all, but only beneficial for uh, the particular ones who look in faith. So you got to understand those two perspectives in order to understand, I think, what the view of the extent of the atonement is being universal, the universal extent of the fact that he's given his life for the world, not just for the elect within the world, as the Calvinist would often read that. Verse 52, and the Jews begin to argue with one another, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Again, they're not getting the parable. They're not understanding the analogies that Paul, that Jesus is using here. Uh, they're not connecting the manna, the word, with Christ. Um, and so all they're he hearing is cannibalism, okay? They're, they're hearing he's he's going to give us flesh that we're to eat this. And remember, the concept of, of cannibalism is not new uh, to this this century. I mean, th th this is something, or new to our century. In other words, this is something they would have heard of people eating people's flesh before at that time. And that would have been obviously repulsive to them. Uh, as it should be. And so you can see why that might cause them 
uh, to some, some concern. So then Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. So here, think about this for a second. Let's be just rational and just, let's just, and to, just back away and just look at this fresh and new. And, and, and notice they begin to argue with one another. So Jesus is sitting right there and he's hearing them argue with each other. Okay. And one of them is going, how's he saying we were supposed to eat people's flesh? Instead of Jesus going, whoa, whoa, time out, time out, time out, guys, time out. I'm not literally saying you got to take a bite out of my arm. Okay. Let me explain what I mean and, and, and stop and, and go through it with them. He doesn't do that. It's almost like he's, it's almost like he's smiling. It's almost like he's going, <laughs> if that made them mad, wait until they listen to the next thing I tell them. Not only do you have to eat my flesh, you better drink my blood. I mean, he, he doesn't soften it any. He makes it even more difficult for him. Why? Why, why, why would he do this? If not for the strategic reason that we've been going through this entire time, he has an end game here. He has a strategy. He's going to Calvary. And if these people are following him to get their stomachs filled or for whatever motives they may have, he's not going to get there that way. He's got to provoke them. And that's exactly what you see there in verse 53. I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. Now, just as Brian mentioned earlier, notice it's the eating and the drinking precedes the life. Okay? Don't eat and drink. You don't have life. You refuse to come to me to have life. Not, I refuse to give you life so that you'll certainly come. Never says it that way. So you have to eat and drink, which is talking about, again, inclining your ear to listen. That's what he's talking about when he's talking about eating and drinking. He's talking about listening to the truth of the word. The man is the word. Jesus is the word. You're listening to that truth so as to have life. Verse 54, he who eats my flesh listens to me, listens and learns from me, and drinks my blood, listens and learns from me, has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. So this, this repeating of raising them up on the last day is said throughout the chapter but it doesn't do it without responsibility of the person to listen and learn from the father first. Always has listening and learning from the father and listening and learning from the son, which are one and the same. He says over and over again, they're one and the same. I speak the words the father's given me to speak. They're listening, they're listening and learning from the father. And that's the ones I'm going to raise up on the last day. Okay. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Again, He's not, he's not pulling them aside like he does with his disciples and explaining what he means by this, by this metaphor that he's using here. Or maybe it's a simile. I'm not sure which one I never could get those right in my English class. But he's using a comparison of his flesh with the truth of the word, okay, with the, with the, the, the truth as being metaphored with his flesh. Partaking of manna with mouth is like partaking of the word of God, ingesting the word of God, okay? My flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Now, some religions and worldviews have taken this so literally as to try to eat transubstantiation and the, the, the changing of bread into the literal flesh of Christ and all these kinds of things. Why? Because they're trying to literalize this metaphor of Christ. They, they've, they've missed it, <laughs> too. And they're, they're, instead of listening to what the parable means behind the scenes, they are trying to literalize this and make the the, the Eucharist and all the, the, the arguments and debates that have gone on for centuries over reading this text so literally as to, to, to think that we're actually taking a bite of the flesh of Jesus Christ when we uh, when we partake of the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper or something of that nature. Um, that's not obviously his meaning here. Never has been his meaning. meaning and the, and the, 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 the fact that people take it that way show that they're still not listening to the meaning of the words behind the scenes. You're not seeing my signs, as he said from the very beginning. You're not really seeing the meaning of what I'm doing here. You're not, you're not really understanding. Um, anything you want to add to that, Brian? All right, 57. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father, so that he who eats me, he also will live because of me. So he's still using that same language as hard as it is. You know, he could soft pedal it here. He could he could explain he who listens to me, he could change it to the word listen instead of eats. 
but he just stays with the analogy. Okay. He stays with that hard language because he's served. It's serving his purpose to, to provoke these people. Brian, go ahead. Yeah. Let me just say that he actually did give the interpretation in the beginning. He said, who I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me, shall never hunger. He who uh, believes in me shall never hurt. So, so actually the coming is the eating and, and the believing is the drinking. Um, but he didn't say he didn't say that interpretation. But you can you can get that interpretation from his own definitions of of how do you get rid of the hunger? Well, you you um, you believe. I mean, you you uh, come to him. How do you get rid of the thirst? You 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 believe in him, and so coming and believing is the eating and the drinking. And he's going to actually come back to that later on when he does interpret it for his disciples. Um, let me try to get some side chat in here as well. Um, this is a good, good commentary, Brian. I appreciate that. Um, based off of John six fifty three, how can reformers claim to have life before they eat of the flesh of Christ? They claim to have life so that they can eat his flesh. Well, the verse is very clear. They have no life. Um, yeah, and that's what we we're talking about before. Um, in verse 53 is what he says there. So the son of, so Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you do, you have no life in his name. Again, the order salutis has always gotten backwards by the Calvinist in every situation. Um, and of course we're making that claim as an argument. And, and that's another point that you can't, uh, you, you can't, and unless you create, like I said, the way the Calvinist, if a Calvinist was on here to be fair to a Calvinist, the way the Calvinist would, would say was there's two different kinds of life. They, they might say one's a quickening or a regenerative type of life. And then there's the new eternal life, the real life. Again, where the, I just ad hoc making it up, I guess. I don't, it, there's no Bible verse that explains this. It's just theologically systematized in order to deal with the system. And that's part of the problem is that you can't, you can't have it that way. Um, Yeah, I don't, yeah. There, there's a lot of them on the side chat, but I don't want you to have to make make y'all sit and wait for me to read through those. Brian, if you see any of them that you'd like to highlight, you feel free to to do so. Um, this is a bread which came down from heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. Verse fifty eight. In verse fifty nine, these things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, "This is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it?" Um, so what is a difficult statement? Again, this is where my Calvinistic friends, where, where he would say, oh, this difficult statement here, that's that's Calvinism. See, Calvinism is difficult. It's hard to swallow. And, um, and and so who can listen to this? And so he would try to equate us Arminians, non-Calvinists, provisionists, all this, all, all of us that don't accept Calvinism. He tries to put us in this camp of with these the, with these Jewish people who aren't accepting his teaching about eating flesh and drinking blood and that being his flesh and his blood, um, which is such a stretch. It, it made, it, it almost made me pull over in my car because it's just, you just, it's this, Oh, you know, kind of feeling of, I cannot believe y'all, y'all wonder how I can be so nice whenever I'm the broadcast is because I get it out of my car, you know, it's uh, <laughs> yelling at the, at the <laughs> windshield in front of me. So it's things like that. So I was saying, okay, the difficult statement here, who can listen to it is not the difficult statement is not Calvinism. Okay. The difficult statement is eating flesh of, of Christ and drinking his blood in order to have new life. Okay. That's the difficulty. I've come down from heaven, blasphemous, eat my flesh, <laughs> cannibalism. Both of these are hard, difficult teachings, and that's why they're grumbling. That's why it's called difficult, not because he's teaching for the first time ever Calvinism. Okay, um, it goes on verse sixty-one. But Jesus, is, but Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, "Does this cause you to stumble? Remember, stumbling is a part of the plan. Okay, that's what Romans nine through eleven is all about." God has the right to harden whom he wants to harden. And if people have grown rebellious and if they've have, have grown um, uh, distant from God so much so that God uses them in his plan of bringing redemption and they cry out, crucify him, they are stumbling. But remember what 1111 says, they have stumbled, but not beyond recovery. That he hopes that his ministry to the Gentiles will provoke them to envy so that they may leave their unbelief and be grafted back in. And the reason they're cut off in the first place 
is not arbitrary. It's not because of some unknown reason before the foundation of the world. They're cut off for their unbelief, according to chapter 11, verse 20 and 21. 22, maybe. I've got it in front of me. Somewhere between 20 and 23, I'm pretty sure. All right, so they're cut off for their unbelief, not for no apparent reason. Um, so does this cause you to stumble? Are you stumbling over these teachings? Are you stumbling over this parabolic language? Are you stumbling over my metaphor? Are you stumbling? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? In other words, if this parable causes you to stumble, if this, this call to eat my flesh and drink my blood, what's going to happen when I when you see me ascend to where I was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. Now, this is this to me is really valuable because so oftentimes people want to separate the word from the spirit itself. But notice what Jesus says here. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. Why is that valuable? Why is that important? Because a lot of people say, well, it's the word in conjunction with the spirit. Like the words over here and the spirits over here, and they're separated somehow. And what I'm saying is, no, no, no. The spirit brings the word. Okay, so the the spirit, by the means of the word, brings life, brings truth, brings revelation. The spirit is the means. The, the word is the means by which the spirit brings light, revelation, truth. So the spirit inspires Paul to speak truth, so that you understand truth, and that you're responsible for what you do with it. Now, the Spirit may use other means. The Spirit may, you know, miraculous signs and wonders and may work in different ways. But everything the Spirit does is sufficient to do what it says it's supposed to do. And that is to draw men to himself, to invite people, to tell people who he is, um, to, to let people know that he's there so that they can respond to him. And so the Spirit's means are always sufficient to do what the Bible says they were meant to do. So if the Spirit brings you life through, um, brings, you, brings you truth through inspiration, then that's sufficient to enable the person who hears this tr that truth to believe that truth. Why? Because it's from the Spirit. It's from God. Go ahead, Brian. I, I just want to bring in a, a, a side point because this passage has been used so much by Roman Catholics to try to teach the need for transubstantiation and really eating the flesh and drinking the blood. Um, that verse right before in verse 62 uh, I think is important where, you know, they're questioning this whole physical thing. They don't understand it. And he says, what if I take my body and go back to heaven? I mean, he, he's really undermining the physical aspect altogether. That's a good word. By saying, hey, I'm going back to heaven. It's my word that's going to bring life. It's, it's the spirit and the word that's going to change you. And, and that's how you take me in. That's how you you know, it's believing in me. It's coming to me. It's it's not actual eating flesh and drinking blood. Um, and and I really think John left out the upper room um, communion uh, in his gospel. I think he left it out at the end uh, because my guess is they're no different than we are today in that first century. I, I think uh, the first, second century sacramentalism was already starting. You know, they, they wanted to add circumcision right from the beginning. They wanted to add something ritualistic to, to get salvation. And I, I think John is making a corrective here uh, against any kind of sacramental teaching. Very good. Good, good words. Um, so late, picking up where we left off, verse 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and of life. But there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. Okay, so why is this significant? Um, there are some of you who do not believe. Remember, we've already looked at John 12, 39, and he's told, them, he's told us why he doesn't believe. John 12, uh, verse 23 through 28 tells us why they, they're resisting, why they would not be convinced they're suppressing the truth. Um, and it has nothing to do with Adam it has nothing to do with the nature from birth that they can't, uh, you know, uh, can't do this. They're, they're, it's because they have refused the truth for so long that they're now blinded to the truth, even though it's right in front of them. They have eyes that cannot see. 
um, which means natural eyes that cannot spiritually see the truth in front of them because of their rejection, not because of some ontological reality from birth. Okay. So for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were, who did not believe and who was that would betray him. So here's where we have a, a little bit of the foreknowledge aspect that God knows somebody's heart, knows their intentions, knows, knows Judas, for example, was actually very money hungry, um, was not following Jesus for the right reasons. Jesus has insight into his heart. He knows things that we can't see about a person. Um, and so even though he was chosen, he was not a true follower. So he was chosen, but not for the same purpose that Paul was chosen for, for example, or that Peter was chosen for. So you, but you can't read that to say, okay, therefore God determined for Judas to be what he is. And that's, that's what some people, again, philosophically do to the text is that because God knows Judas's heart, therefore he determined Judas to have that kind of heart. And that's simply not what the Bible teaches. Um, I, I, th I think it's been, the case has been made before that if, if, if people say, well, um, so Judas didn't have any freedom in this matter. Well, God can you could have used any vessel um, at that point in time who was in that condition, that hardened condition, to bring about his purpose. The fact that he knew it was Judas and that he used Judas doesn't mean that Judas didn't have freedom in his choices with regard to Christ and what he, he ended up doing. And so I think it's important not to allow a philosophical concept of how divine knowledge works to dictate how you philosophically read this text because there's nothing in the text which gives any indication that God's knowledge was somehow causal or that God's knowledge somehow forced Judas to do what he did and uh, he couldn't have done otherwise. There's, no, there's nothing that indicates that. Um, and he was saying, for this reason, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted. Uh, this is where the word enabled comes in. It's the word granted or enabled. Now, the word granted or enabled never means to effectually cause. Never has, never will. If if I grant um, if I grant the link to Brian Wagner to enter into this chat, which I did for about 12 or 13 other people, um, he was able to come on. I enabled him to come on by sending him the link. I granted it to him. Does that mean he had to come? No. The other people I granted it to didn't, didn't, didn't come for whatever reason, right? Just because I grant something to somebody doesn't mean it causes them to do it. Um, this is one of the reasons we can say in the scriptures, where the scriptures talk about this, um, we praise God that he has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life, as he says in Acts, I believe it is. Well, does that mean every Gentile believes? No, he's granted it to the Gentiles. How? By bringing them the gospel of repentance. So I bring them the invitation so that they may repent, but it's still their responsibility is to do with it what I what they will. And so um, granting somebody something or enabling something doesn't effectually cause it to happen, which is what we were talking about earlier with the word draw. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, this word just is another synonym for the drawing. Uh, the drawing doesn't necessitate coming. It makes coming available. Uh, it makes it a, you're able to come when you're drawn and, and you're able to believe when you're when you're granted that opportunity. And he's been he grants it to everybody. He's using creation and conscience. He's using dreams and messengers. He's he's he, his light has has enlightened all men that come into the world. And he's not willing that any should perish. So he's long suffering and and using granting the, even the word grant. I think you have to realize uh, the Greek word. I, I'm just checking it out here. Yeah, didomy. Um, <clears throat> didomy is it, we use normally translated give. Uh, but the, the word is very broad in Greek, um, than just when we think of give, we actually think of putting it into somebody's hands. Uh, but the word, it could also be translated offer. Um, you're, you're giving the opportunity, you're offering. Right. Um, and so. Yeah, that's a good word. Um, yeah. So it, anytime you hear Calvinists use the word enable or granted, um, just ask yourself, why do they interpret that word to mean to irresistibly cause or to effectuate? Um, because the Bible never does it that way. Um, and and, they're, and they're, it's just not even the English language. I mean, Greek language or English language, neither one of them suggests this word here is some kind of an irresistible or effectual word um, that, that causes the person who's granted or enabled to, to do that thing which they're granted or enabled to do. Um, 
<laughs> I, okay. Uh, well, I, I'm trying to interact with some of the side chat. And so the, I think David, our nice Calvinist left earlier. And so now we'll, we'll engage with another Calvinistic friend of ours over here. Uh, Calvinist Carter says, why do you spend so much time trying to refute Calvinism? I used to enjoy hearing your ministry, but now it seems like everything is completely about Calvinism. So just stop and leave the subject. Um, well, one, Calvinist Carter, I would like to know when you knew me besides Sociology 101, because Sociology 101 was created uh, by me as a former Calvinist for the purpose of addressing what I believe are Calvinistic interpretive errors, uh, which I've strived to do, obviously, since about 2015 when I started this. Um, but it's not all of my ministry. I'm assuming maybe you used to listen to me at First Baptist Richardson. Um, maybe you've you've known my ministry, my teaching through Texas Baptist in Super Summer, um, or my ministry with evangelism, um, or my, my, my work at D Dallas Baptist University as a professor or at Trinity. Maybe you've seen those works of me, and now you're just looking at Soteriology 101 and this page, which was created for the purpose of unpacking what my dissertation was about, which was addressing the rise of Calvinism within my convention. Um, and so the, the call to just stop and leave the subject um, my, my other question is, are you going to the website called monergism.com, uh, Calvinist Corner, uh, Re reformationtheology.com, um, and there's about 16 others that are directed towards uh, teaching or together for the gospel, for that matter, um, or the other, other sources that are uniquely Calvinistic and promoting Calvinistic doctrine, and are you posting on their sites, hey, stop talking about promoting Calvinism all the time or refuting Arminianism all the time, just stop and leave the subject. And so... Um, this is kind of a double standard that Calvinists sometimes have when it when it comes to this issue, is that they're they're okay with ministries that are promoting their view of soteriology, but if there happens to be another group that's promoting their perspective in a cordial manner, mind you, um, then that that's somehow evil or wrong, or you know you should do something else. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, at least at least you don't call yourself anti-Calvinist flowers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Calvinist Carter. Uh, has himself has his own Facebook page to deal <laughs> with one subject, I guess. And uh, now he's upset that you're dealing with one subject on another Facebook page. I mean, it's just that is irony of ironies. He names irony. himself after Calvin and, and then critiques critiques us for confronting Calvinism. That's interesting. Yep. Um, all right. So continuing on with that, which is important. Verse 66. As a result of, of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So look at the result. Look, look at the result of what happened when Jesus taught about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Um, this is, gets to the question of Mark 4 that we talked about with our last episode in engaging with J.D. Um, is, is why would he use parables? And it tells us why he uses parables. Lest they see, hear, understand, and turn, and I would heal them. Um, so wh why would he speak like this, causing many of them to withdraw and not to walk with him anymore? Doesn't he want them to walk with him? Doesn't he want them to believe and follow him? Why isn't he stopping them? Why didn't he say, hey, guys, wait, 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 wait. Don't leave. Let me explain what I mean by this flesh eating analogy. Okay. Let me, let me get it. To, let me break it down for you. He lets them walk away, not because he doesn't love them, not because he thinks they stumbled beyond recovery, um, not because he, he doesn't want them to be saved. He is accomplishing his purpose of redemption through their unbelief. And many of these same people are very likely the same people who cry out, crucify him in the coming weeks and months and thus accomplishing the very uh, the very salvation that they so desperately need. Um, and many of these same people are very likely the ones who end up coming at Pentecost and believing in him eventually once they see the truth of what he was saying. Um, and so Jesus turns to the 12 in verse 67. Do you want to go away too? You're going to go away also? You leaving? Remember, the 12 had seen him walk on water. The 12 had seen him raise the dead. The 12 had heard how he explains himself after the fact. So they're not going anywhere. Where are we going to go, Lord? Simon Peter. Lord, where, to whom shall we go? We're pretty much ostracized here. We're, we're attached to you. Where, where are we going to go? You know, what, what are we going to do? You have the words of eternal life. So it seems as if Peter's kind of getting it. Peter's kind of saying, okay, when he's talking about flesh, he's talking about the eternal word. So notice, here's the first time the word words. Jesus has been talking about flesh and manna. Peter gets it. He's you have the words of eternal life. If I listen to your words, that's how I that's how I partake of the manna. So Peter's following the analogy, at least somewhat here. Um, verse 69. 
we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So remember, he is he has been given to the Son by the Father. Arbitrarily, without reason, no. What, what, what's different about him? We believed. We've come to know this. We believe this and have been given to you. We know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, did I myself not choose you, the twelve, yet one of you is a, disciple, a, a, a devil? Um, this goes to the John 15, 16 passage that we just recently confronted with uh, Al Mohler, who reads John 15, 16 as if it teaches the doctrine of Calvinistic election. I did not choose you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, which is obviously in reference to choosing disciples for apostleship in the same way that I not choose you. I didn't choose you. I chose you the 12. Yet one of you is a devil. One of you is a devil. Now, remember, Judas is not the only one he calls a devil in his ministry. I'll point that out. Satan called him. Uh, I mean, uh, Peter was called Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. When was Peter called Satan? What did, what did Peter do to be called Satan? He tried to thwart Calvary. Think about that for a second. Peter was trying to protect his God. He believed Jesus was God at this moment, and he tried to protect his God. Don't, don't you down, don't you, you're not going to cross. I will cut somebody's ear off if I have to. I'm stopping that from happening. And what is, what, and that's well-intending. Think about this. Peter is well-intending when he's doing that, isn't he? He's trying to protect his God. He's trying to protect the character of his God. There's some, forgive me, Calvinists, for making this analogy, but I'm not trying to call you Satan in doing this, but there's some, I think, parallel into what Peter's motive is in protecting Jesus and what I think the Calvinists are trying to do with protecting God because they're, they're like, okay, you can't, you can't make God lower than he is. You, you can't say that God condescends. You can't say that God is, is not all controlling. You can't do that. You got to keep God as, as all powerful and all controlling. And the reason I think that, that Jesus is saying to Peter, get behind me, Satan, is because what you're doing ultimately is trying to stop the plan that God has, the strategy that God has to get to Calvary. And they don't want to see Jesus brought down to that level. They don't want Jesus brought down to a, a suffering servant. They want him to be a conquering hero. And that's the reason he says, get behind me, Satan. Um, and I, I just, I only point that out because to recognize that when he, he's referring to them as a devil, it's not necessarily meaning that um, that Judas's nature was that of the devils, or that that this was again predetermined for Judas, and Judas had no control over the fact that of, of his devilness or his devil uh, is his devil like attitude here, um, because even Peter was referred to as Satan at one point, and so this is more of a reference to um, to to a person's choices, behaviors in that given moment, given time, and then last uh, finally verse seventy one. And of course, he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the 12, was going to betray him because, he know, of course, he knew that. Um, all right. So we got through the text. I'm surprised we actually got through it all in two hours and a little bit over two hours. So that's not too bad, I guess. I think we did all right. What do you think, Brian? Yeah, really good. I, I just to comment on choosing the 12, uh, that passage in John 15 that's been misused by Calvinists. Um, it, you know, didn't I not choose you to bring forth fruit? Or something. I forget the exact wording there. Um, but the the uh, verse nineteen says he chose them out of the world, John fifteen nineteen, and so you have to be in the world before you can be chosen out of it. So it couldn't be before the foundation of the world uh, that the choice is being made there in John fifteen. Good word. Um, Irenic makes the point saying that if the Calvinist wants to tie the choosing of Jacob over Esau to their doctrine of election i.e. chosen to carry the family line, uh, chosen individually to be saved, they're, they're a bit arbitrary uh, and goes on to say, Jesus answered them, do not choose you the 12 and yet one of you is a devil. And so what I think ironic is, is pointing out is that just because God chooses someone for a purpose, like what we've talked about uh, several times before, God can choose Jonah to be the minister to Nineveh. And he can even use persuasive means like a big fish to convince him to go there. 
Uh, does that somehow prove, therefore, that God picked out certain Ninevites and irresistibly through some inward secret means causes them to believe Jonah's message? Of course not. That's a non sequitur. But sometimes that's what Calvinists do is they take the calling of Paul, for example, on the road to Damascus, or they they take the choosing of the 12 apostles uh, and they say, look how they were chosen. That's how I was chosen. Uh, it's a very egotistic reading onto the text of ultimately um, saying I, I am I'm called out and chosen like the apostles and prophets were. Um, and and uh, I'm sorry, I, I mean, I didn't have that experience. Um, I did not have a, a Damascus Road experience of God blinding me and throwing me on the ground. Um, I, I believe through their message, as John 17, 20 prays uh, Jesus's prayer. I, I pray for my apostles that's given to me by the Father. Um, and, and I pray for those who believe through their message. Uh, and I'm one who believed through their message. I'm not one who is irresistibly or effectually knocked off my horse or swallowed by a big fish in order to be convinced to be an apostle. Um, and so you, you can't take passages which are uniquely about God's calling of Israelites for the purpose of bringing the message to the world, which is something he's determined to do. In other words, God does determine some things. And what is one thing he's determined to do? To bring the truth through Israel. But what if Israel's unfaithful? Will God's purpose fail? Romans chapter three says no. So even if God, even if God, even if the Israelite, the messenger that's chosen is unfaithful, God has means at His disposal to make sure the messengers go anyway. And just because He does that doesn't mean, therefore, God uses some internal irresistible hocus pocus. You know what I'm saying by that? Some zapping theology of regeneration, some new life that's never talked about, that's not eternal but it's new, um, given to certain people and causing them to believe the messenger when he gets there. Again, that, that's just never taught in the pages of Scripture. It's all read onto the text uh, years later. Um, Daniel asks this. He says, uh, do you think Calvinism debates should be split in two philosophical and theological arguments for and against? I think that can be beneficial um, in some degree because uh, I but I don't know how you do that. I mean, um, you can't separate philosophy from theology completely because you're often making philosophical statements about your theology <laughs> when you're making it. And so um, uh, ideally you would like to separate some of those things out because oftentimes in these debates, you're making a theological point based upon the exegetical commentary and you say, well, that can't be true because philosophically my mind can't comprehend how God knows something that he hasn't determined. Okay, so you've just made a philosophical, you, you, you've allowed your philosophy to dictate what your theology is. In other words, because I can't imagine how God knows something that he hasn't determined, then therefore he must be the, he must be the one who determines it. Um, I think that's allowing your philosophy to ultimately drive your theology rather than allowing the text to speak for itself and accepting the mystery where the Bible affords it. Um, and so, yeah, it would be it would be nice to be able to uh, to keep philosophy or philosophical things out of the discussion. But uh, as C.S. Lewis says, a good 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 philosophy must exist if for no other reason to answer bad philosophy. And I think theistic determinism is just really bad philosophy. Go ahead, Ron. Yeah, as long as you keep philosophy as subordinate to, you know, interpretation of scripture and, and what we call theology. I mean, theology really is kind of the connector between both the exegesis of scripture and, and the philosophical concepts that come from general revelation or, or thinking, reasoning. Um, and so, yeah, so scripture is really going to have to be the, the final judge of what we want to call theology. Uh, Irenic says, um, but such all you one, even the determinations God makes, he makes using the free acts of men. Um, yeah. I mean, that that's what we would say with Judas and Pilate, for example, whenever you quote from Acts two and four, that talks about how God brought about his plan of redemption through Pilate and through Judas and all these people who did according to what God had determined. Um, is that God knowing people's actions in their hearts can bring about his purpose and plan through their free actions. And, and we, that's when we use the, the sting operation analogies and things like that to explain even a cop can pull this off. How much more can God do it? If a cop can do it, uh, then how much more can God do it? 
Um, and that's why we, we don't we don't appeal to those human analogies because we think they're one to one ratio perfect analogies any more so than the analogies that Jesus uses relating us to sheep or rocks or or whatever. Um, analogies are helping us to relate a particular point, and the point we're trying to relate to is that if a man with limited knowledge can use a criminal to bring about a particular event that would be considered a crime or evil without themselves being implicated as the cause of that crime or without being the cause of the intentions of those criminals, then how much more can God do that? And I don't think we need to put uh, question the holiness of God or talk about God being the somehow causal determiner or decisive cause of men's pride, lust, and flesh, especially when first John 2.16 specifically says that pride and lust are not from the Father, but from the world. We can't put on to God what God doesn't put on to himself. John James says he doesn't even tempt men to evil, much less causally determine them to choose and desire evil, uh, which is really where the Calvinistic system, I begin, uh, I think, really fails. Um, this user asked the question, um, according to Calvinism, if individuals had to be regenerated first, how have how would that have worked in the Old Testament? Um, there is a, a there is a video I remember listening to sometime a long time ago, and I couldn't tell you where it is, where Piper is asked that question. Um, and you will get a variety of answers from Calvinists on this. Some believe that regeneration did happen in the Old Testament. Some don't. Um, and, and it depends on where you go and what group you're listening to. Um, and, and this is where you'll get some who will argue, yes, we believe there was a working of the Spirit but it wasn't a regenerative type of working like you find in the New Testament. Um, and so they will create a new category of, of the spirit working. So, for example, when Abraham believed and it was credited him as righteousness, well, was Abraham therefore regenerated um, in the Old Testament? Well, the Bible never says anything like this. Uh, the Bible never talks about the Holy Spirit indwelling uh, Abraham in the, in the way that is spoken of in the, the New Testament. And so that's all speculation that the Calvinists would have to bring. That's one of the reasons that I, I dropped the whole world view of total inability that had been adopted by some classical Arminians and Calvinists, because that's one of the problems that you put yourself into a quandary on is saying, OK, people have lost free will and they need this partial work of regeneration or this irresistible work of quickening. Then what do you do with Old Testament passages with all these people reacting to God in these ways? It, it, it makes it puts a bunch of baggage onto the scriptures that just make it really difficult to interpret and understand. Yeah, they would have to have regeneration in the Old Testament, or how could he have faith? I mean, how could Abraham have faith without having his will regenerated first, according to Calvinism, to then have faith, to then be imputed with righteousness? So so they have, I mean, to be consistent, they would have to have regeneration. They either have to have regeneration have to have or regeneration in the Old Testament. Right. They either have to have regeneration or something equivalent to regeneration that they may not cause they may not call it regeneration because clearly there's something different happening in the new testament believers than in the old and so they're a, a quickening or something different with some of them now some of them do just say there is regeneration in the old testament some of them say no it's different than regeneration but there's something that happens and they'll give a different name like quickening or something like that that happens um same song, second verse. Quickening is just a King James word for regeneration. I know, I know. I know. But it, it, like I said, it's like, okay, two wills of God. You know, we got the prescriptive will, external will, and the internal, and you've got the two two calls of God, the, the effectual call and just the general call. Uh, love of God. You got the salvific kind of love, the determinative I mean, there are, there love. There are definitely words that have more than one meaning in the scripture. Of course, of course. But you got to get that from the context. And that's the problem is they want to impose upon contexts definitions that it's just too much for those contexts to bear. Um, I'm reading through. David is back. Um, I, I get, we've been on so long, David, you were able to leave and come back. So. Congratulations. Um, but your position is that nothing has to take place internally by God in any sense, right? Including any concept of prevenient grace. Um, no, I mean, okay. So the way I've illustrated this before, David, is with Sean Cole. Uh, and I won't do the same thing I did with Sean Cole to you, but Sean Cole and I were talking and and, and he said something about this and, and this. And I said, man, Sean, golly, I'm, I'm so sick of you. And he's like, what? Like, I mean, Leighton's always so nice to me. And I said, I said, man, I'm just sick of you. 
you just, man, you offended me so bad. I cannot believe you did that. And I just started getting on to him. And this is a live broadcast. You can go back and listen to it. And I was laying into him. And Sean was like, what are you talking? Layton, what did I say? I'm so sorry. What did I say? You know, and Sean was going, was like backpedaling. And I said, I said, little old Layton Flowers said a few words and look at all the emotion that affected inside of Sean Cole. And that's just me. If Layton Flowers can say a few words and increase your adrenaline and make all those emotions well up in within you and a little podcast like this, how much more so can the words of God not only penetrate through bone and marrow, but soul and spirit? When we talk about the word of God, we're talking about the inspired word of God, which impacts not only the outside, but the inside. That's why we say um, that, that old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me is a bunch of bull. Why? Because we know words can hurt much more than sticks and stones can. And words can have impact. That's what we were talking about earlier in John 6. This, the words are spirit and life. And so when I speak truth, truth brings life. Truth will set you free. Truth has power. Not because it's just external, but, but when it enters and you hear it and it impacts you, it has internal impact. And so, again, when we talk about grace, we're talking about the means that God brings grace. Truth is a means of grace. He reveals truth. It impacts you. It impacts you deep down within you. You can suppress it. You can push it down or you can accept it. That's your responsibility. But it impacts you, everyone, internally. Everyone is impact, impacted by truth. And, and I don't think we can deny that. So, yes, there is an impact of truth. Um, uh, Brian, do you want to comment on that, Brian? I was going to say, yeah, every time the word is spoken, I believe with all my heart, it does divide the soul and spirit and thoughts and intents, at least in these two ways. It produces the thought that sounds true. And it produces the intent, I should look into this more. And, and so there's a responsibility that the word, I believe, causes every time. It has that kind of light power, or whatever you want to call it, that, that the thought is already there, this sounds true, and the intent is already there, I should look into this more. Now, if your heart's heart, if your heart is heart, uh, if your heart, heart is hard, hard, hard <laughs> or you have hard thought, it's shallow, it, it's uh, it's not going to stay that long, or it's going to get choked out, or and so there is a responsibility for you to he that has ears to hear, let him hear. I mean, it's responsibility for you to to respond to those thoughts that the word's given you, and to seek to say, I, I should look into this more. I, I need to find out more about this and uh, this truth. Yeah, um, David asked on the side chat. Um, so what about 1 Corinthians 118? And David, maybe we just need to have you on. Um, we could do another broadcast and just have you on and you can ask these questions live because I, I don't I think you do a podcast and so you're not you're some people are afraid to get on podcasts and I'm not putting them down. This some people just don't like talking in front of cameras and I don't blame you. Um you can get in trouble that way. So <laughs> as I well know. Um, but uh 1 Corinthians 18, let me just pull it up on the screen here. Um for the word of the for the word of the cross is foolish to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved is the power of God. I have an article on this at Sociology One One if you're interested in it. Um, but the way the Calvinist reads this, at least, correct me if I'm wrong, David. If I'm if I'm mis misinterpreting uh, your understanding of this, but what it seems like you're saying is that the cross is foolish by nature. In other words, it, the cross is naturally foolish to those who are perishing. In other words, to the reprobate, to the non-elect, to the unregenerate person, maybe we should say, um, it's just foolish. So a person comes out of the womb, they grow up and just naturally, they just think, man, the cross is foolish. And, um, and that's the reason they perish. Um, that's not what I believe Paul is saying. I don't think he's trying to say that the cross is just naturally, uh, irresistibly foolish to people. And they just will always reject it because of its foolishness. I don't think that's the dichotomy Paul is pulling up here. It's not, the elect versus the, the non-elect or the reprobate versus the elect here that it's in the economy. It's those who trust in the wisdom of the world versus those who are trusting in the wisdom of God. And that's what the whole chapter reaches the word wisdom. I don't remember how many times here, but several different times he's con contrasting those who trust in worldly wisdom versus those who trust in divine revelation. So if you're trusting in worldly wisdom, you will deem the cross as foolish. If you trust in divine revelation, you will accept the cross and be saved. And so it's still your responsibility as to whether you deem the cross as foolish. 
if people are deeming the cross as foolish because their nature determined for them to deem the cross as foolish and they couldn't do anything about it because of the decree of God, then you're kind of taking away their blameworthiness, aren't you? You're kind of like, well, I, I deem the cross as foolish because I was born deeming the cross as foolish and I couldn't do anything about deeming the cross as foolish because that's the way God decreed for me to deem it. And I'm saying, no, don't give them that excuse. They deem the cross foolish freely because they rested on the wisdom of the world instead of listening to the wisdom of God. It's their own fault. They shouldn't have done that. <laughs> they could have done otherwise. Whereas on your system, they couldn't have done otherwise because God didn't give them the eyes to see the truth of the cross. God didn't grant them, quote unquote, draw them through some effectual work of grace. And thus you give them, I think, back the very excuse that Paul takes away. So that's the way that I would I would say it. Um, the the, the uh, Calvinist has to stick in the word all there, you know, all who are perishing. And, and so uh, why don't we just say all kinds of people who are perishing? <laughs> it's right. full of, it's foolish <laughs> to all kinds of people who are perishing. Um, and he, he's replying here. He says, no, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Yes, but why are we being saved? You can't just assume because we're effectually made to believe. I mean, that's what you're reading on to that. No, to us who trust in the wisdom of God, it is the power of God into salvation. So you can't just assume. I think what you're doing is with the Calvinistic lenses, you're on, you're on, you're saying, but to us, the elect ones, who are being saved because of God's unconditional election of us and irresistible grace towards us. Again, the verse never says any of these things. I think that's what's being read onto it. And I think if we back up and look at the entire context, he's he's contrasting not elect versus non-elect, chosen versus unchosen. He's contrasting those who are trusting in the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of the of, yeah, of I mean, God. Look at verse nineteen, there. You know, it's it's not it's not foolishness to everyone who's perishing. It's foolishness to those that I'm talking about who are perishing. The, they they are the wisdom of the world. They are the they they think they have it thought out, and he's trying to convince the Corinthians not to not to divide over. You know, the, the, this whole section is about them dividing over following men and following the wisdom of men. Right. Absolutely. Well, this has been fun. We've gone over an hour, two hours, sorry, two two almost two and a half hours now. Good night. We are such theology geeks. 